Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto was the great grandson of Toborama. Before I start, please support for more amazing content, and do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This is written by Adrian Skywalker and link in description and support writer. Let's start the video. Chapter 1 Genetics The boy looked with blank eyes as he stood within the market street of Kanoha. Dead bodies littered within the streets as a stream of blood flowed throughout the village. The overcharged emotional hatred that the villagers had forcibly repressed for the boy had furiously burst open with a vengeance, when they learned that the boy had passed his shinobi graduation exam, after being carefully guided by some discreet prodding from some nefarious elements in the village, who wished to gain political leverage in the village by trying to manipulate that atmosphere for pursuing their own agenda and succeed in their goals. Once the boy had passed, on the very same day after some time, some of the people who had regularly tormented the boy in his childhood were brutally murdered and their mutilated corpses had been displayed in the village square with a forged note that literally screamed that the boy had done it. At the fact that it was done on the anniversary of the QB attack and with the flaming words written in the forged note, along with some provocative speeches by the agents of the people who masterminded this scheme. This act had broken the forced restraint of the villagers and they were lost to a frenzy of bloodlust and lost all sense of logic and reasoning. Rumors that the boy had stolen the sacred scroll of seals in an attempt to release the QB added to their zeal as well. The villagers in the mad frenzy of revenge had killed the only two persons in the village who had ever cared for the boy. Irika Yumino was killed by the villagers for the crime of passing the demon child, while the third Hokage had been betrayed by his own shinobi and was murdered. Then, the crowd in bloodlust had turned to hunt the boy and murder him. However, once the boy learned of the death of his two parental figures, he entered a catatonic state where his mind went numb with the shock. Such severe psychological trauma exacerbated with the extreme amount of physical torture inflicted upon him removed the final vestiges of humanity in him. He simply allowed the crowd to do whatever it wished. He now had no desire to live. However, the crowd in their frenzy to kill the boy forgot to factor in one crucial element. The demon sealed in the boy was not willing to end its existence in such a manner. Due to the nature of assault the boy's mind had endured, his brain shut down allowing the demon to temporarily gain control of his body. The result was too catastrophic to imagine. Two-thirds of the village population was exterminated, or rather to say subjected to genocide by the demon-possessed child. The plan concocted by the person who had orchestrated these attacks to gain control of the village had backfired magnificently. Kanoha was now damaged beyond repair. As the child stared blankly at him, council member Danzo glared at the boy who had single-handedly destroyed all his plans. All his scheming, planning and maneuvering had come to naught. He trembled in incandescent rage. His root forces had been exterminated. The shinobi forces were totally incapable of handling the boy and 65% of Kanoha ninja forces were now extinct. However, the civilian damage was the highest. In the 11 years it had been imprisoned in the boy, the demon had cultivated an extreme hatred for the villagers of the village when it witnessed the extreme xenophobia the villagers had exhibited towards its prisoner. It had relished in its temporary freedom, and finally it had achieved its goal. More than 90% of Kanoha's civilian population had been the direct target of the demon's attention. Kanoha would never rise again. As Danzo watched everything he had hoped for crumble, he saw that the demon had finally released its hold on the boy, and that the boy had finally reverted to his catatonic state. He may have lost, but he would gain some satisfaction by killing the one who had cost him everything. As Danzo was about to move towards the boy, loud ringing laughter rang throughout the streets. Danzo turned around and saw the one person who would probably have enjoyed what had happened. Orochimaru, the snake Sanin stood in the blood-strewn street clearly savoring what had happened. He looked at Danzo and smirked. You were always too ambitious for your own good, Danzo. In your bid to gain power, you overlooked one fact. You never involved demons in the affairs of humans. I too had created the same plan you used, but I abandoned it, because I knew it would have this effect. You, in your greed and haste did, and as a result today you have destroyed Kanoha itself. I must say I have to thank you, in a way you did do my work for me. I always did say that Kanoha was too corrupt to survive. It was only a matter of time before the village destroyed itself, and I must say it has been, and in a rather spectacular fashion, he again laughed loudly as Danzo scowled. I didn't anticipate this turn of events. If I had known this would happen, I would have never involved the demon, the crippled man spat with disgust. Orochimaru shook his head, probably not like this, but you definitely would not have left him alone. He is a rather valuable commodity, is he not? Even at a fraction of all the unlimited power in the world sealed within him, he has brought down one of the five major powers in the world. No wonder that almost every nation in the world covets them. Poor child, born the son of the greatest of our kind, oh yes, I admit it, Minato surpassed even me, but still, to be hated and shunned by the very ones he protected, such as the fate of Jinchiriki, the man sighed dramatically. 
They are needed, but not wanted. However, today I believe the world has learned a valuable lesson. Either treat them well or don't create them at all. The world will be thanking you, Danzo. You will be remembered as the fool who taught the world a valuable lesson. Because of your actions, from now on, either Jinchuriki will cease to exist or they will be treated like royalty. Sad that the one who was responsible for these turn of events will not experience that, he mocked the man. Danzo growled, why are you here? I am here for the boy. Oh, don't look at me like that. You think I will let the one who fulfilled my ambition be left like this, to be hunted by the world? My shinobi are already exterminating all the remnants of Konoha. Soon, no single person will be living in this place. Once their job is done, I will bury the village and mark it as a mausoleum. Only my two former teammates will remain alive along with me as the remainders and the proudest achievements of what used to be Kanoha. Before Danzo could reply, he fell down dead as a white bone pierced him, and as it sprouted out of his chest Kimimaro Kagaya walked in. Well done, Kimimaro Kuen, take the child and bring him to Kabuto. I want him to be cared for very well. Now leave, while I finish my preparations, he ordered as the white-haired teenager went towards the vacant-looking boy and led him away. The boy did not react at all and let himself be herded away like a sheep. An hour later, the greatest explosion in the history of the shinobi world reduced and buried an entire village. On that day, status quo was changed in the shinobi world, as only four major powers remained. Jiraiya and Tsunade were heartbroken with grief. Nine months later. In one of the many bases of Orochimaru, Kabuto Yakushi looked at the glass jar in front of him. And it was the most prized genetic experiment of Orochimaru. Naruto Uzumaki, the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi was in suspended animation. He had been subjected to many genetically altering experiments that would have been impossible to conduct on normal shinobi or human beings. When he had arrived, his mind had been so heavily fractured and damaged beyond repair that they had no other alternative but to use a forbidden technique and completely erase every vestige of human emotions within him to spare the torture his hellish memories inflicted upon him. Even the intensity of those memories was dampened. The technique was used in such a severe level that he lost most of his memories. He forgot most of the events that had occurred in his life. He barely remembered his name and those of his meager acquaintances that he had had once upon a time. However, the memories of the day of graduation were firmly entrenched in his mind, that and many of the memories of the various instances of psychological abuses he had suffered were still there. But at the same time, due to the brilliance of Orochimaru's techniques, he no longer felt any type of emotion whatsoever. Orochimaru's aim in experimenting on him was to create the perfect shinobi. His body was being genetically engineered to peak levels. Knowledge of certain fighting arts was forcibly imprinted in his mind. However, the ultimate pinnacle of his bioengineering skills was successfully proven when he managed to finally integrate the cellular samples taken from the corpse of the Naidame Hokage into the boy. As he had once failed to integrate the cellular structure of the Shodai who happened to be the elder brother of the Naidame, in order to recreate the ability of Mokutan, Orochimaru had this time decided to take a more calculated and subtle approach. While not as powerful as his brother, the Naidame was still a very powerful shinobi who ranked among the five most powerful ninja of all time. What Orochimaru intended to achieve was to give Naruto the same level of mastery the Naidame had in his elemental abilities. The Naidame had taken elemental chakra manipulation to the highest level biologically. His body had attuned itself and refined his two elemental natures of water and lightning particularly to the level where they were almost like a second skin to him. Added to the fact that he was also a master of genjutsu was just an icing on the cake. However, the operation was not without its side effects upon Naruto. While his regenerative abilities allowed him to survive the rigor of the operations, his body underwent drastic changes. His body structure changed and he now resembled a teenage version of a hybrid of Naruto and the Naidame. While he retained his looks, his hair was now white and resembled the ancient Hokage's hair. He also attained the distinctive markings the Naidame had on his face, and his whiskers were now gone. He now had three brown markings like tree branches one from the bottom of the chin rising up to the point below his mouth and two of them arising from behind his ears and falling just short of reaching the gap between the nose and the spots just below the eyes. His eyes also became brown instead of blue-colored. And to Orochimaru's immense delight, he displayed that he had indeed acquired the two elemental natures and they were rapidly beginning to evolve to the level of the deceased Hokage. Orochimaru in his exuberance implanted the knowledge of some of the powerful water and lightning techniques he knew to the boy. Today, however, was a special day. They were about to initiate the final phase in the experiment, after which the boy would be removed from suspended animation and tested out. As Kabuto looked up, he saw Orochimaru busy with a certain sealing array. Orochimaru had decided that Naruto's mind was in a too fragmented state, and it had to be renewed completely. Simply put, he was going to wipe the boy's mind completely, and install a new set of memories. 
In this set of memories, the boy would retain the memories of his village tormenting him, and him slaughtering the village, but at the same time, he would be removed of all sorts of emotion, but, and this was the brilliant part, he would not be removed of rational thinking. In short, he would be nothing but a perfect fighting machine with unparalleled intelligence, and a being devoid of most of the human emotions. This would, according to Orochimaru, in theory, mitigate any emotional damage the boy may otherwise undergo. The boy for all purposes would be what would be termed in scientific terms as a robot with sentience. Orochimaru had taken great pains to ensure that the QB didn't interfere in his work. However, he had not realized that the amount of experimentation he had done on Naruto would have actually destroyed the boy, if not for the QB's hastened regenerative abilities and that had had rather unexpected consequences. Which he was about to find out soon. As Orochimaru was nearing the end of his operations, suddenly the entrance to the room was blown wide open and the entire Akatsuki stepped in. Madara Uchiha stepped forward and spoke, Did you really think you could hide him from us, Orochimaru? You were too busy in experimenting on your new pet that you actually ignored us, as you will now learn to regret. Hand over the Jinchuriki, and we will make your death quick and painless. Orochimaru scoffed and prepared to battle, however, he knew that his chances were slim. Therefore, he decided to awaken Naruto and field test him to even out the odds somewhat. However, in his haste, he forgot that his operation was still incomplete. He had finished the planting of memories and the removal of emotions, however he had not yet sealed the technique, which meant that although the boy had lost all emotions, he was not barred from learning them again. That would prove to be both a boon and a curse in the future for Naruto. As the battle near them hastened, the QB which had been severely weakened made a rather rash decision. So, he is here, I must now hurry or else all will be lost. I don't know whether this will work. The seal forbids me, but it has now weakened thanks to the snake, and there is the faintest chance that this may work. It grumbled and began to unleash all its chakra. As the fox began to unleash all its chakra, the combat in the room stopped. Madara tried to use his Sharingan to subdue the Kyubi. However, because of the condition that Naruto now was in, his Tsukuyumi was not even worth a damn, and therefore Kyubi was not impeded. The Kyubi piled on tail upon tail of chakra, until it began to seep out through various forced cuts from the boy's body. The seal had until then prevented the Kyubi from escaping from the boy's body. However, the weakening had dampened its effect and the Kyubi had theorized that although it couldn't escape from the area in which the seal was proscribed, it could in theory escape by forcing its way out of other areas of the boy's body. The success rate for this was well below 1%, but the Kyubi was beyond caring. It should have cared. The seal reacted, albeit lately and as soon as it sensed that a part of the Kyubi's sentience leaking out, it clamped down. So, in essence, the Kyubi was now trapped between Naruto and the outside world, and as the seal had not expected this anomaly, it overloaded. Because of the augmented physical characteristics of the boy's body, thanks to Orochimaru's experimentation, the Kyubi was forcibly ejected out of Naruto. However, the chakra overload piled and imploded in itself creating a wormhole that began to suck everything in the area. Because he was unconscious, Naruto was instantly sucked in and to the horror of everybody vanished. However, as the very force that was tethering the chakra itself was cut off, the chakra had no recourse but to detonate. And so it did, the Kyubi, Orochimaru and the entire Akatsuki, including even Madara and Pain were annihilated in what was termed forever in the shinobi world as the day of the black sun. The entire rice country was devastated by the explosion. Even though he was gone, the child of prophecy had brought balance to the world. However, his adventures were far from over. His new life was about to begin. As Naruto woke up groggily, he was surprised to find himself in a forest. He stood up to see where he was and to get his bearings. His body was still injured and there were lacerations on his body. However, most of the cuts were healed. As he walked forward, he suddenly stopped. In front of him, a mile away, stood Kanoha. But that was not possible. Kanoha was dead. Suddenly, he grabbed his head and sat down as a searing pain shot in his head. As the memory modification process initiated by Orochimaru had been interrupted, his memories were now a jumbled mess. He remembered the torture the villagers inflicted upon him as well as the murders of Irika and the old man. He also remembered bits and traces of him losing control and slaughtering what appeared to be villagers and shinobi. He stood and stared at the village. He could now leave and never return. But that would lead to another slew of problems. However, he came to the conclusion that he had very little information. He had no recollection of what had happened. He did not know whether he had come back to the past, or to another dimension. So, his most promising option would be to enter the village. As he moved forward, suddenly he buckled and collapsed. As he groaned, his brain was assaulted by memories, feelings and thoughts of another being. As he lay there moaning, after an hour when his body had stabilized he got up to his knees panting. The new set of memories he gained were of him. As weird as it was, Naruto had gained the memories of Naruto. So, his initial estimate had been correct. 
he was in the past or more accurately a parallel dimension. However, as two souls could not exist in the same plane at the same time, the soul of the apparently weaker Naruto had been absorbed into him. But the Kyubi was not present in him, and if the soul of the younger Naruto was gone, that meant that he had perished, and that would mean the seal on his body would be activating right now and... He sank to the ground as the most massive spike of chakra he had ever seen erupted as screams and shouts were heard from the village. Naruto could not bear the strain anymore and collapsed. He never saw the Anbu come near him, accompanied by the Hokage as they carried him into the village. In the hospital Sarutobi was pacing frantically. When the spike of chakra had erupted, he had feared that the demon had ruptured the seal and had escaped. He had first gone to the boy's apartment, but it had burned to cinders. Soon, he traced the boy's chakra signature to the forest outside the wall and raced there. His shock at seeing the new appearance of the boy was mitigated by the sheer panic and hysteria gripping the village. As he was musing in his thoughts, he was interrupted by the head healer. How is he? The Hokage asked immediately. He is tired and has undergone severe strain. However, as far as we can say, he is completely normal. But his new condition is baffling. We tested him for bloodline capability taking in his new appearance, and the results were well surprising, the healer spoke in a hushed tone. Surprising? How? The Hokage asked. Take a look, the healer gave the charts to the Hokage. As Sarutobi looked at it, he nearly jumped out of his skin. This is, he whispered. Yes, the healer continued, that boy is a direct descendant of the Night Aim. He has inherited his abilities exactly. His body is also showing similarities physically. We don't understand how it is possible, the man threw his arms up in exasperation. Let me see him, the Hokage spoke and without waiting for a response barged in. He lifted the boy's shirt and gaped. The seal was gone. Gulping, the old man channeled some chakra in the spot. Empty. No trace of the demon. No residual chakra as well. Hokage-sama, the healer asked tremulously. He knew the ramifications of such an occurrence. The demon is gone. It is really, really gone. The Hokage exclaimed loudly. That is excellent news, Hokage-sama, the man whispered as his eyes began to glow. This explains it. The demon must have been suppressing his abilities and now with its departure, it has manifested, the Hokage spoke in a whisper. An ANBU came in and stopped near the Hokage, Hokage-sama, the crowd is getting restless. You must do something, he spoke in a near panic. As he made to move forward, Saratobi stopped as a bevy of thoughts flew into his mind. Rat, he spoke to the ANB wearing the rat mask, wait outside, and announced to the crowd that I shall be making a formal announcement in ten minutes, and allow no one and I mean no one, into this chamber until then. Execute anybody, who tries to circumvent that, regardless of their station, the Hokage ordered the ANBU who looked perplexed, but departed nevertheless to obey his leader's orders. Doctor, please forgive me for this, Saratobi muttered as he suddenly knocked out the doctor before the man could as much as twitch. As the man slumped, Saratobi began to weave a number of seals, and after finishing, applied that seal on the doctor's forehead. You will as of now, forget what has happened here, the Hokage spoke in a soft tone as the man lay in his hands, unaware and unconscious. You will forget everything that you have learned about this boy's heritage. When asked by anyone, you will state that Naruto Uzumaki perished, and that the demon departed with him, that is all, the Hokage spoke and those words were imprinted subconsciously in the doctor's mind. The technique the old Hokage had used was a hidden hypnotism technique taught to him by the first Hokage, one which would subconsciously impart orders into a person, to make them compliant. After that, the Hokage again rapidly made some seals, and summoned Enma, the monkey summoned clan king. Sarutobi, what is the meaning of this? Why have you called me now? Enma asked as he materialized within the hospital chambers. Enma, time is short, and I need your help. Something of monumental importance has occurred, Saratobi spoke quickly as he looked at his old friend. I sense that something has occurred in the spiritual plane, Enma spoke as he sniffed the air, and then his eyes fell upon Naruto. Saratobi, is that the grizzled ape spoke in surprise when the Hokage nodded interrupting the ape. For some unknown reasons, the QB perished tonight, leaving the boy's body. Furthermore, apart from that, drastic changes have occurred to his physique. He automatically aged by at least six years approximately, and above all else, we have learned that he is a descendant of Toborama sensei the Hokage spoke in a soft tone. Even Emma's eyes widened, so, you want me to, the ape began when Saratobi interrupted hastily. Yes, this boy is the last living male of the Senju line as of now, and he cannot be allowed to fall under the thrall of the Goikanban, Council of Village Elders, at any cost. He has suffered enough already without this to add on his plate. I will announce to the village that the Jinchuriki has perished as well. I want you to take him to the monkey caves now, and then send a message to Tsunade asking her to meet me on the sly. Hurry Enma, I cannot wait anymore, the villagers are getting restless, 
the Hokage urged and the ape nodded his head in agreement. Very well, I shall comply for now, but we need to talk later, Sarutobi, Emma replied softly as he made the seals for the reverse summoning as he grabbed the bed Naruto was on and vanished in a puff of smoke, as Sarutobi left to face the music. The village of Kanoha had broken into celebrations as the news of the death of the Kyubi had spread, and spontaneous celebrations broke out everywhere. Once Sarutobi had made his announcement, the roar of joy that had emerged from the crowd had rent open the skies itself, and the villagers had descended into drunken revelry. The council after hearing Saratobi's deposition as well as that of the doctor, had accepted the news as well, much to his relief. Danzo had demanded to see the dead body, but Saratobi replied by stating that Naruto's body had turned to ashes when the Kyubi had rampaged and there unfortunately was no body to show, and although skeptical Danzo had acquiesced at that moment. Saratobi had even taken the extra precaution of mind-wiping the members of the ANBU squad who had helped him in bringing Naruto to the village hospital, and even the ANBU rat as well as collateral insurance to ensure that the truth would stay buried. He and Enma were now the only beings alive that knew that Naruto Uzumaki was still alive. That night, as the celebrations had begun, Saratobi had deigned to join, and his people had left him alone to mourn the child, who they knew was close to the old Hokage. As he eyed the celebrations, Saratobi felt a sickening bow rise in his throat which he forced down with revulsion. It was said that Kanoha was supposedly the beacon of humanity amongst the great five hidden villages the moral compass that built its foundations on bonds, love and friendship. The only words that Saratobi could associate with those that so heavily embraced those notions was, utter bullshit. Kanoha was no different than its sister villages for at the end of the day a shinobi would forever remain a shinobi. All the altruistic word games and hollow reassurances were nothing more than a front to cover the ugliness of the way of the ninja. How else could he explain the hypocrisy that ran rampant through Kanoha? They worshipped the ground prodigies from bloodline-wielding clans walked on, their blood giving them the spark of greatness only rarely attainable by other people of their generation, and treated their common peers who were not so lucky with despicable shoddiness. And yet, when it came to the current topic of their celebration, all these noble people, all these kind-hearted people, seemed to lose their warmth and humanity, and viewed that person as a being whose worth was less than the dirt they trod upon with their feet. That more than all, convinced Saratobi that he had made the right decision when he had sent the boy away with Emma. Suddenly, his reverie was broken as a monkey summoned itself into his chambers. Saratobi-san, Emadano has asked me to bring you to his location, now. Sunadeheim has arrived as well, and one more thing, the child has awakened, the ape spoke in a low gravelly tone as Saratobi nodded. Very well, Hiroshi, let us be off then, he spoke as he laid a hand on the ape's shoulders as it weaved the hand seals needed for the reverse summoning, and both Hokage and Summon vanished in a plume of smoke. They reappeared on the outskirts of a cave, in a hidden hilly terrain, which the Hokage instantly recognized as the area near the forests of Otafukagai. As he walked in, he noticed Enma, Tsunade and another young woman, whom he recognized as Shizen, Tsunade's apprentice standing around a bed upon which the boy was sleeping. Tsunade, I apologize for this inconvenience, but I hope you understand that I had no other choice, he spoke as he eyed his student and surrogate daughter. Hi, sensei, she replied in a quiet tone. Saratobi looked at her in surprise at her quiet tone. For the first time in a long time, she looked forlorn and confused. He grudgingly realized that it would have to be a shock to her as well. After all, she had believed herself to be the last of her clan, and now, she had learned that her granduncle had a descendant. It was a lot to take in. Do you have any doubts as to the veracity of my claims? He asked, and she softly shook her head. No, I have conducted the tests on the genetic markups myself, and well, he is the descendant of Tobiji-san. So, I have decided to accept your request, and decided to take him in. But who is he, sensei, and where did he come from? Tsunade asked in a vexed tone. It appeared as if she had been holding back that question for a long time, which was apparent from her tone as Saratobi let out a sigh of relief knowing that Tsunade would take the boy in after all. He is or rather was, Saratobi paused for a minute as he replied, the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi. For some inexplicable reason, the Kyubi suddenly perished yesterday and left this plane of existence. And even more surprising was that within moments after it left, his physiology and his appearance changed drastically. He actually aged by around six years. I have never seen anything like that, can you explain why that happened? He asked as he looked at Tsunade who looked stunned. I don't know, sensei, I may have to conduct some tests myself to ascertain the truth, the slug San Nin admitted. But still, you haven't answered my question. Who exactly is he? What is his heritage? Whose son is he? She asked again as Saratobi shrugged. We don't know. Minato was the one, who made him into a Jinchuriki, and he died before he could reveal to us who he was. All we found at the scene was a newborn child lying above the dead body of the Yandame Hokage, that is all. I am afraid the secret of his parentage will remain a secret for all time, Saratobi shrugged as Tsunade narrowed her eyes. 
The boy is waking up, Enma interrupted and everybody turned around to see Naruto waking up. As the boy looked up at them all, Sarutobi stepped forward with a kind smile. Naruto, I would like you to meet Tsunade of the Sanin, the old man introduced the two. Naruto nodded quietly. Tsunade was surprised to see no reaction at all from the boy, but she hid it well. What brings you here? The boy asked them quietly. Sarutobi's eyebrows rose. He shrugged, it has been revealed that you are the descendant of the Nighting. Tsunade is the last surviving member of that clan and therefore she is your only relative alive. As such, she has come to offer you a home. At this, Naruto stared at the woman. Had he been the Naruto of old, this would have elicited a very different kind of response. Naruto shrugged, thank you, but it is not necessary. I do not wish to impose. Sarutobi's eyes rose higher. Something was definitely wrong. This was uncharacteristic of the boy. Tsunade also hid her surprise well. Naruto, she is your relative. You must stay with her. Your new status brings you enemies as well. You surely understand that, right? The old man reasoned. Naruto looked at the Sanin. Who exactly are you supposed to be? My grandmother or something? He asked her quietly. A vein ticked in Tsunade's temple as Saratobi hastily began to cough while Shizen turned purple. Enma, on the other hand, gave a hearty laugh. Of sorts, yes. But you will not call me grandmother, the Sanin glared as she looked at the boy. Would you rather I call you old woman then? The boy asked in the same tone as Saratobi stepped back in surprise. Shizen paled further praying that her teacher remain calm. Tsunade eyed the boy. Something was very different about this boy. Grandmother will be fine. You are the only person who will be allowed to call me that. Remember, and with that the Sanin walked out in a huff. Saratobi spoke up, Tsunade and I have reached an agreement. As of now, you will reside with her permanently. It would cause unnecessary problems in the village, if your newly discovered heritage were to be revealed. It is precisely for this reason that I have secreted you away from the village. The accident, whatever it was has caused the Kyubi which was sealed within you to depart, which as you may notice has wrought many drastic changes in you as well. I have managed to convince the villagers that you perished in that accident as well. As of now, you will gain a new identity and a new name and live as Sunati's grandson, so that this may never be discovered. Are you okay with this? The old Hokage slowly asked, as Naruto took in all the information quietly without batting an eyelash. Naruto shrugged, whatever you say. It doesn't matter either way. Sarutobi looked at the boy and nodded and walked out followed by Enma and Shizen. Outside the room, he was met by the Sanin. Noticed it, did you? She asked her teacher as the old man looked at her with his eyes brimming with questions. Yes. I don't understand. He is never this quiet or unresponsive. He was a massive prankster and loud mouth. However, since the demon left he has changed too much, and too drastically. I don't understand, the old Hokage sighed as he massaged his temple in annoyance. Tsunade spoke quietly, it is possible that the fox have repressed his abilities forcibly. The traits you described match the behavior exhibited sometimes by foxes. Now that its oppressive presence is gone, perhaps the true nature of the boy is going to come out, she mused. Sarutobi sighed, so, this is what he would have been like without the fox, is that what you are saying? He asked his student, who nodded in reply. Yes, even I sense something disturbing about the child, Sarutobi. He has no emotions, no reflexive behaviors from what I observed and that is a dangerous trait in a shinobi. He didn't even react to the change of surroundings, and no other child of his age would remain so deadpan at hearing what you explained to him. It appears that it is as if he has lost his humanity itself, when the fox departed. You were right in bringing him to the princess, if anyone can heal him, it is her, and must spoke in agreement as well. Very well, Tsunade. I will leave him in your care, take care of him, Sarutobi spoke as Tsunade nodded in agreement. You will have to keep his existence a secret. As of now, this boy is the last living male descendant of the Senju clan, and if the Goikenban learns of it, they will not rest until they force you and him back into the village, but I will give you as much time as possible, do you understand? Sarutobi asked as Tsunade nodded. You will have to give up your nomadic lifestyle and settle down somewhere, somewhere remote and inaccessible by any normal means, can you understand that as well? Sarutobi continued and she nodded hesitantly. Shizen's face broke into a small smile at that. Well, I must leave now. I cannot leave Kanoha unattended for long. I will devise a proper new identity for him and send the details to you through Enma. Saratobi spoke as he walked inside to say goodbye to the boy. It would be another five years before they would see each other again. As he left, he left behind him a grandmother and a grandson, who would spend the next five years trying to establish a relationship, and during that time, Tsunade would learn just how special her new grandson really was. Five years later Kanoha would explode with frenzy as the news of the hidden Senju clan air would resonate in its streets. The heir of the Senju clan and the grandson of Tsunade of the Sanin, Senjureha, 
the one who would rock the foundations of the village to its core. Chapter 2 Revelations As he looked through the window of his office at his village, Saratobi could not help but sigh in despair. He had been there, when the village had just barely formed, learning under the two greatest shinobi in the world, as their chosen successor, and he had led it through an era of unprecedented bloodshed and warfare, and had brought it to the pinnacle of its prosperity. As he stood there, he allowed his mind to wander over the memories of the people who had aided him so ably in bringing that said prosperity for their village. The Senju brothers had founded the village and had brought it great prosperity and stability, but it was he who had preserved it through the bygone ages. He remembered the legends of past, with whom he had worked, and of whom he was considered as one as well. Hataki Sakumo, a magnificent shinobi of the likes born once in a generation, who caught in his own despair had ended his life prematurely. That had been a tragic waste. It was no secret that Saratobi had intended to make the man his successor, but his death had left a void, which he had hoped would be fulfilled by his own students, among them the sole legacy of his mentors. And yet, the one in whom he had vested most of his hopes had betrayed him, while the one whom he had neglected had turned out to be his sole crutch in the future to come. Yet, he and Sakumo were the relics of an era which nobody now remembered, and he stayed in the minds of the people only because of the recognition his position brought him, along with the stories of his prowess in a bygone era of ninjas whose name was forever enshrined in the minds of ordinary people. But then again, from those ninjas who had made a name for themselves, there were those who surpassed understanding and were deemed as legends, such was the impact that they had upon the world. Three such individuals were the students of the professor, of him, the Sandame Hokage of Konoha, who was recognized for knowing and actually using all of Konoha's techniques, which numbered in the thousands. The three students of his team, unlike any other team in Konoha, each became a great individual force and tremendously powerful each displaying different talents, yet becoming almost equally strong, and even then, never as powerful as they were together, for which they were named the Sanin by Sancho no Hanzo, a legend among legends, and the only surviving enemy shinobi of his time still alive. The two of them were contemporaries and rivals themselves, although their rivalry was but a pale imitation of the greatest shinobi rivalry of all time, of that of Hashirama Senju and Uchiha Madara. Later on, when the Sanin searched and contacted the particular animals that now distinguished them from their other comrades, and gained those animals' blessing to summon their kind, that name evolved and they became known as the legendary three ninjas, or the Densetsu no Sanin. Since then they had been called as such, Tsunade, the slug tamer, Orochimaru, the snake handler, and Jiraiya, the toad hermit. Since then, they had always been the Sanin, the three, the great summoners. Better together than apart, for together they were unstoppable. What, Saratobi questioned himself as he looked upon the Hokage monument through the window, would the remainder of his students be called now? Would they become the legendary two ninjas? The Nainen. Would Orochimaru be remembered as anything but a traitorous snake? Or would that particular name fade into the history books of the world as legend, nothing more than a memory of a time when a team of ninja as a whole gained so much respect? Maybe, just maybe, when future generations speak of the Sanin, they will speak of them with awe and wonder, and they will remember them as they once were, as three parts of a whole and not as a friendship broken by betrayal. Chuckling softly at the direction of his thoughts, the Sandame simply relit his pipe and took a puff from it, looking out of the window to see the morning light stream atop the treetops of Kanahagakur and enter his office, illuminating the spacious interior. Truly, it is no small wonder that so many great shinobi come from this very village, even when peace was so abundant within it. And then his eyes fell upon the Hokage monument illuminating the face of his successor, eerily bathing it in a halo of golden light. Namike's Minato, the student of his student, and quite possibly the one man who reminded him of Hashirama-sama himself. An outstanding ninja in all ways, he was the one who had single-handedly ended the Third Shinobi War and had saved Kanoha. Recognizing his worth, the Third had made him the Fourth and for a brief moment, had enjoyed a break, with his hard-earned but much-deserved retirement. And yet again, when disaster struck, Minato rose to the occasion magnificently, by sacrificing himself and saving the village and the world in the process. And yet, it was he upon whom it had fallen to preserve Kanoha, once more. He chuckled wanly. He should have been called the preserver instead of the professor it looked like he was the one who was called every time to preserve the status quo, and he was getting tired of it. As of now, the power of the village was waning, although only a few in the village knew of it. The attack of the Kyubi had dented the village's power severely. Minato's sacrifice had saved the village, but at a terrible cost. Only the myth and reputation of Konoha's legends and past deeds acted as a deterrent against any hostile activities, but it was a thin deterrent. He needed to find a new leader one who would bring the village back together from the internal strife that was plaguing it. As it was, the tensions between the Uchiha clan and the remaining members of the Goiken band were running high, and meanwhile, regular skirmishes were occurring with Kumogakure on a weekly basis. He realized the signs. 
He was getting too old, and he needed to choose the Godain quickly. He would not wait too long, and because of it leave the village vulnerable. Jiraiya would not be suitable, and his intelligence network would crumble if he abandoned it. It would seem that Tsunade would have to return after all. And if the rest of the council opposed it, stating her absence, he had a fait accompli ready to offer. The last heir of the Senju clan, who would come with his grandmother and become the Godame's right hand, just like Sakumo had been to him. He sat down and began to draft a letter to the daimyo. He had a lot to accomplish, and he hoped that Tsunade would spare Enma when he went to deliver the message. Within days, news soon spread like wildfire across Kanahigaku no Sado. Their village would soon have a new Hokage, as the council had finally backed the Sandame selection and announced that the inauguration of the fifth generation Fire Shadow of the Hidden Leaf would take place in five days. When Saratobi would hand over the reins of the village to his previous student, the slug princess and one of the Densetsu no Sanin, Tsunade Senju. In his office, Saratobi was busy signing some documents when the telltale sign of an NBU squad materializing inside his office was heard. Without looking up, Saratobi spoke up, Please remove your masks, for this next mission will require you to masquerade as Jonin in public. The Hokage spoke softly as rustling sounds came up. Saratobi looked up to see his best ANBU squad standing in rigid attention with their masks removed. Hataki Kakashi, the current commander of the ANBU and his protégés. Yuzuki Yugago, a young and promising Kenjutsu practitioner. Tenzo, the lone survivor of Orochimaru and his genetic mishaps, and the lone Mokotan user in the world alive to date. And finally, the newest prodigy of the village, the thirteen-year-old Uchiha Itachi. Hokage-sama, we are ready for our mission, Kakashi spoke softly as the Hokage looked up. Kakashi, for this mission, you shall defer to another ninja who shall act as your superior, the Hokage spoke without preamble while the eyes of Kakashi's subordinates rose for a fraction. Someone with enough rank to command the commander of the ANBU. But who could? This mission will be led by my apprentice, Jiraiya of the Densetsu no Sanin, the Hokage concluded as the eyes of everyone went wide. To work with the Sanin was the dream of almost every shinobi in Kanoha. I am honored, Hokage-sama, that you and Jiraiya-sama found me and my team worthy, Kakashi replied softly. The other members of his team remained silent, but their eyes revealed the tale. To be chosen by a Sanin to perform in a mission, never again would they doubt that they were the best of the best of Kanahagakura no Sato. Your mission, Kakashi, is to rendezvous with Jiraiya Niro Tafukigai, from where you will accompany him to retrieve and safely escort back to Kanoha, the Godame Hokage, Tsunade of the Sanin, my other apprentice, the Hokage concluded and even Kakashi's eyebrows rose a fraction. His team was by now standing still, realizing that this might possibly be the most high-profile mission of their career. As you know, tension with Kumogakure is at an all-time high, and we suspect that Kumogakure may try to attack Tsunade if this news gets out, that is why, you cannot go out as ANBU, because that will be tantamount to declaring publicly what you are up to. You must keep this mission as low-scale as possible but I don't think that the possibility of anybody attacking you when Jiraiya is with you is high, and it will be even less when Tsunade joins you. Attacking two of the Sanin is suicide for anyone unless they are Akaga themselves, and that is disregarding the fact that you all will be present, the Hokage concluded. Hi, Hokage-sama, Kakashi nodded, chuckling to himself as he imagined the possibility of someone attacking a party consisting of Jiraiya, Tsunade and himself, not to mention his team. You will depart this night, prepare and outfit yourselves accordingly, the Hokage ordered as the team left his office, immediately via Shunshin. Uchiha Clan Enclave. Fugaku Uchiha's home. As expected of my son, Fugaku spoke proudly as he eyed Itachi who knelt in front of him. You have been accepted into the ANBU, and that too as a member of the squad of the ANBU commander himself. The Uchiha clan head spoke as he eyed his eldest son as if he was a prized commodity. Meanwhile, young Sasuke Uchiha, the second son of the Uchiha clan head was trying futilely to gain the attention of his father but was failing miserably. If Fugaku noticed those attempts, he paid no heed to it. Itachi, as a clan head, I am privy to what this mission is, and I need not impress upon you the importance of this mission. It is your luck that for your evaluation mission, you have landed a mission which many ANBU would give an arm and a leg to be assigned to. I have no doubts that the success of this mission will go a long way in helping our clan integrating with the rest of the village, which is why I have decided to ask Hokage-sama to permit me to accompany you along as well, his father spoke in a soft tone as Itachi nodded softly. Furthermore. This is a great opportunity for you to make an impression on the person you are escorting. Do you understand? Fugaku spoke in a quiet tone as his eyes morphed to reveal the Sharingan. I do, Itachi spoke softly, but I am afraid that I will have to refuse this mission. He spoke with a soft smile as he looked at his father who almost stumbled in shock. Are you out of your mind? Fugaku nearly screamed, his jowls quivering with anger as his eyes flashed red. Itachi, do you not understand the significance of this mission? You are the pipe connecting the village to the clan, did you forget? 
he spoke softly as Itachi nodded. I do, however, tomorrow is an important day for me as well. Tomorrow Sasuke begins at the academy, and it is the most important day of his life, and it is necessary for someone from the family to be with him. And if you are also going to be on the mission, then he will be left alone, therefore, I will request the Hokage to let you go in my stead. Surely, even you two must have received the notification from the academy. After all, isn't that so, father? Itachi spoke softly as Fugaka stiffened. Itachi continued in the same light tone, After all, missions will always arise, but I have only one brother, and this day will come in his life only once. Itachi spoke as the young boy looked at him in gratitude. Very well, I will go to the academy. You concentrate on the mission. Fugaku spoke softly as Sasuke's face lit up in happiness. Thank you, Nisan. Sasuke spoke as soon as their father left. Thank you very much. The boy spoke again, but Itachi could detect the faint resentment in the boy's mind that their father favored him more. Father can be difficult, Sasuke. But that doesn't mean that he ignores you, you see, the reason why he is so interested in this mission is because it is going to change the entire village, that is why Itachi spoke softly as the boy's eyes widened. Wow, what mission is that? Sasuke asked in wonder as his eyes widened. You know I can't tell you, Sasuke, Itachi spoke with a sigh as his brother pouted. Fine, the elder Uchiha sighed as he saw his brother's pouting face, it will soon be public anyway, however, you must keep it a secret until I return, Itachi warned as the eager young boy nodded quickly. I am going with my team to bring the Godame Hokage back to Konoha. In five days, the Sandame will retire and the village will have a new Hokage. I am going with my ANBU team to escort the new Hokage back to the village. Itachi spoke softly as the boy's eyes widened. His already sycophantic adoration of his elder brother shot to hitherto unseen levels as he heard the kind of mission his brother would be going on. Two days later, Nero Tafukagai. Nero Tafukagai, Kakashi and his team, dressed as normal civilians, were sitting quietly in a bar with Jiraiya who had met up with them there. It was the first time that Itachi had met up with a Sanin, but as he analyzed the man who sat in front of him, the youngster realized that the stories did not do the man true justice. His chakra was so potent that for a second, his Sharingan had been blinded, and the only other persons with whom that had occurred were the Hokage and his father, but even they paled in comparison to Jiraiya. All right, Gakis, Jiraiya began with a thin smile as he noticed the ANBU squad looking at him with disguised awe, while Kakashi lazed around, reading his book. He and Kakashi went back a long time. It came with tradition after all. He had trained Minato. Minato had trained Kakashi. And as such Kakashi was inner circle. Besides, he was Sakumo's kid. And that counted as well. The terrain we are going into is very rough. And although I would have preferred to do this alone. I too agree with Saratobi sensei that having you around would be useful. Kumonin are getting too frisky in these areas. So know this. You are here to play escort that is all. And I warn you beforehand. Keep your mouth shut. If you shout your mouth off in front of Sanadeheim. That will be the last thing you will ever do. Keep your mouth shut, and your ears open, and everything will go smoothly, Jiraiya finished as the members of the ANBU squad nodded gingerly. How far do we need to go, Jiraiya-sama? Yugago asked quietly. She was all raring up to go and meet the woman who is known worldwide as the greatest Kunoichi to be ever born. It is about thirty miles to the west, in the canyons of the mountains bordering the land of iron, near the Three Gorges Hill, a very remote and very inhospitable area, and very deadly, Jiraiya spoke softly. The eyes of the others widened. The land of iron? Isn't that the samurai land? Kakashi asked quietly as the others fell silent. Samurai land? Itachi asked in confusion after seeing everybody else fall silent, unaware of the significance of that statement unlike everybody else. The land of iron, Jiraiya began as he looked at Itachi, is a land that is formed by the three mountains area, and it is a neutral nation with a strong military on par with the five nations. They have no ninjas of their own and the ninjas of the elemental lands avoid that nation as well. Their lands are guarded zealously by samurai, who are numerous and strong, Jiraiya spoke softly. Then why did Tsunade-sama choose such an inhospitable and inaccessible land to live in? Itachi asked quietly. You will know when we reach the area, Jiraiya spoke enigmatically and that was that. Soon, their party left for the land of iron, with Jiraiya regaling them all along the way through anecdotes of the past, including him and Tsunade, as well as stories about him and the Yandame when he was his student. Needless to say, the journey progressed in a much jollier mood than they had expected. Nine hours later. The journey had been arduous, and the path was extremely difficult. Narrowly winding, strewn with jagged rocks and deep crevices, and many dangerous plants lying about, it was clear that this was a very remote area. And a very inhospitable one, as well, which raised the question as to why a ninja of Tsunade's caliber and pedigree would deign to live in such an inhospitable area in the minds of the ANBU members. Meanwhile, the shrubs at the end of the path rustled, 
and instantly the hands of all the ANBU members went to their weapons as they took guard. Suddenly, a person stumbled out of the shrubs. It was a woman in her late twenties, wearing a chainmail shirt and a black kimono. She had brunette hair, and her gait gave away the evidence of her shinobi training. She was, they all noted, rather plain-looking, but attractive in her own way. Ah, Shizen, good to see you again, Jiraiya spoke in a warm tone, at which the ANBU released the hold on their weapons by a fraction. Who Jiraiya-sama, is that you? The woman spoke in surprise as she recognized the toad Sanin. And is that Kakashi? She asked in wonder, as she eyed his subordinates. Her cheeks took a rosy tint as she looked at Kakashi, who waved haphazardly in his usual manner. Everyone, Jiraiya spoke for the benefit of the ANBU who were still eyeing the brunette with disguised caution. This is Shizen, the apprentice of Tsunade. She has been staying with her for more than twenty years now. You can all relax now, we are here, Jiraiya spoke as the ANBU nodded and slowly bowed to the medic. Shizen, I presume that you know why we are here? Jiraiya asked the young woman who nodded with a smile. Hi, Enadano brought the message two days back. We have been busy preparing for it, but she stopped as hesitation entered her voice and looked at the Sanin. What is wrong, Shizen? Jiraiya asked quietly as the young woman began to fidget. Shizen Jiraiya glared and she wilted under his stare. Well, Ano, you see for the last few weeks, we have been having some problems with a group of bandits. Shizen spoke softly as the eyes of the ninja hardened. Well, you see, they are all ronin, and they have become quite a nuisance in these areas. However, they made the terrible mistake of offending Tsunade-sama, who killed their leader and sent his head to them as a message and warning. She spoke with a quiet tone as the eyes of the ANBU widened. However, because of that, those bandits have become incensed, and as such, they, she paused as she looked down and clawed the ground with her feet. Jiraiya cleared his throat, at which the girl gulped and continued hastily. Well, because of that, they waited for a time when we were not at home and raised our house to the ground, and Tsunade-sama is rather angry at that, she spoke quietly as the eyes of everyone widened. Shizen-san, where are these bandits? Itachi asked softly as she looked at the young shinobi in surprise. These bandits have dared to attack the home of the Godame Hokage, and for that crime, their life is forfeit. Where are they located? Yugugo asked softly as Shizen fidgeted even more. Suddenly, the atmosphere was disturbed as a loud crack of thunder was heard. Jiraiya's eyes instantly widened. He has gone after them, hasn't he? He asked Shizen in a soft tone as the woman nodded. I was trying to find him, before he reached those ronin, but it seems that I have failed, Shizen spoke softly. Let us get to him first, we will go to Sinadeheim later, or is she with him as well? Jiraiya asked quickly as he dropped his jolly facade and became serious. No, she is at the campsite, we were preparing to leave to Kanoha anyways, he however decided to deal with those ronin before we left. He was away on a training trip you see so he did not know anything about this. But when he learned of this, well, things just spiraled out of control, she spoke when suddenly another loud crack of lightning was heard. Let us go, Jiraiya spoke without preamble and made for the area where the sounds of lightning had come from. Kakashi and the others along with Shizen followed him without a word. As they neared the area, Jiraiya signaled them to halt and they all stopped and took positions, with kanai and swords drawn, and on guard as they observed the field. In the clearing which was visible, a battle was taking place or rather, was about to take place. Around seventy rogue samurai, with swords drawn and enhanced by chakra were surrounding an individual at whose feet two smoking corpses were seen lying around. It was now clear as to why they had heard the sounds of lightning from this area. The samurai were all wearing identical body armor and helmets with masks, which covered their faces, and they had surrounded the individual by encircling him completely. The individual on the other hand, they noticed, was standing still without a trace of fear in his eyes. He was a young man, around twenty years of age, and he had white hair, which was tied in a long ponytail which reached up to the middle of his back. He was wearing a chainmail shirt covered by a white hakama and white pants along with wooden sandals. His forehead as well as forearms were covered by strips of white clothes as though they were bandages. His ensemble was finally completed by a thin sword which hung around his back and a shuriken holster which was strapped on his left shoulder. Shit, we are too late. There is no stopping him now, Jiraiya muttered as he took in the scene. Jiraiya-sama Kakashi began when the Sanin raised his hands. Be silent, Kakashi, and watch. You are about to see a show unlike any other, Jiraiya spoke softly as he looked at the scene. The others, if they found the conversation strange, remained silent and did not comment. Shizen, they noticed, did not seem worried, but was looking rather peeved. Meanwhile, in the clearing, the assembled ronin gave a yell and charged at the white-haired individual. It was over in seconds, as the young man moved, and before the observers could gather themselves, they saw that all the attackers were lying on the ground dead. With bodies and limbs scattered around, 
covering the land with a wet slick of blood while perversely leaving the young man's white clothes spotless and in pristine condition as he stood still and observed the carnage with a detached look on his face. The ANBU were shocked beyond comprehension at the level of skill displayed by the young man as they watched the scene with their jaws wide open. Fast, very fast, even with the Sharingan, I could not see when he withdrew the sword, and I could count only half of the strikes that he dealt, Kakashi spoke softly. One look at Itachi made it clear that the Uchiha prodigy too had fared similarly, and had been unable to follow the battle completely. Tenzo and Yugago on the other hand had not been able to even sense as much as they had, but it looked like Shizun and Jiraiya had been able to follow the battle. Oh, twenty seconds to deal with seventy men, it seems that he has finally reached a decent level, Jiraiya admitted softly as he looked at the young man with something akin to pride in his eyes. Decent? This was a decent level to the Sanin. The others thought incredulously as they eyed the Sanin, and the approaching young man with newfound respect. This is the level I must reach, if I am to succeed in my mission, Itachi thought stiffly as he looked at the young man in the clearing with calculating eyes. Who is that young man, Jiraiya-sama? Yugubo asked in a somber tone as she eyed the youngster who was making his way towards them with respect in her eyes. His name is Reha, Senju Reha, the grandson of Sunadeheim and the direct descendant of the Naidame Hokage, as well as the last living heir of the legendary Senju clan of the forest, Jiraiya spoke softly, as the eyes of the visitors widened comically as they gaped at the youngster who was approaching them with morbid fascination. Chapter 3 An Ordinary Day in Kanoha Kumogakure, Reikit's Office So, it is decided then? Yujuto asked quietly. The rakage looked over at the younger woman, knowing why the plan had been formulated. It was a good plan, he admitted to himself, an effective plan. It had elements of brilliance in its daring. But Yujuto had allowed personal feelings to influence her judgment. That wasn't so good, as his brother was wont to say. He turned towards the window, and watched the dark night bathing the countryside of Kumogakure in a pale white glow as he considered the ramifications of what they were about to attempt. Yes. Kanahigaku no Sato, Kumo's safe house, two days later. The two men hunched over the blow-up of the map, flanked by several 8x10 photographs. This is going to be the hard one, the one on the right said. This I can't help with. What is the problem, Nakamura? The one on the left asked even though he could see it, but by asking this question he could gauge the skill of his new associate. He had never worked with a rookie before, and as such, he was an unknown quantity, at least in an operational sense. He always comes out by the east gate here. This street, as you see, is a dead end. He has to go straight west or turn north coming out. He has done both. This street here is wide enough to do the job, but this one, too narrow, and it leads straight towards the Uchiha Military Police HQ. Going that way is suicide. That means the only sure spot is right here, but even if we conduct the op, getting out is going to be a bitch. They will have the village in lockdown in minutes, Nakamura pointed. Both these streets are narrow and always have pedestrian traffic on both sides. This building is apartments. These are houses, expensive ones. There is not much pedestrian traffic here, oddly enough. Your guy has to wing this alone, and he's gotta be quick on his feet. Otherwise, he is toast, Shigeo-san. How does he get out? Shigeo asked. It is just three streets away from the safe house, and once he gets here, he can use a reverse summoning seal that will be placed here. If he makes it in, he can activate it and teleport himself to Kumo and be home free, Nakamura spoke softly. Why not catch him at a different place? Shigeo asked softly. Nakamura shook his head, too hard. The roads are too crowded in the area, and the ANBU are always on prowl, and it'd be too easy to lose him. You've seen the foot traffic, Shigeo-san, and he never goes exactly the same way twice. If you want my opinion, you should split the operation, do it one part at a time, like Yujito-sama suggested. The next moment, the table was upturned as Nakamura found his neck under Shigeo's grip. Don't ever ever call that whore as Yujito-sama in my presence, you understand? The man spoke in a guttural tone as his eyes turned bloodshot. That whore how dare they tell me to take my orders from her. She is not even a fucking human being and yet that overgrown mastodon orders me to take my orders from that wench I will. The man ranted as he loosened his grip on Nakamura's neck. Hey hey calm down, Shigeo-san, okay, relax, take a deep breath. Nakamura tried to calm the man hoping desperately that the irate jonin wouldn't kill him. Listen, and listen well, Nakamura, we'll do it the way I want, not how that wench wants it. Shigeo spoke harshly as the rookie immediately nodded in agreement. As the older man walked out, he slowly wiped the sweat off his brow. He had to inform Yujito immediately. Meanwhile, on the ground, the pictures of Hyuga Hayashi lay beneath his feet, trampled beyond recognition. Uchiha Military Police Headquarters, Kanoha, the following day. In the halls of the Uchiha Military Police HQ, Sergeant Yashiro Uchiha, the deputy head of the Kanoha Military Police, walked down the double line of military policemen 
and his long-practiced eyes didn't miss a thing. One man had lint on his green, high-neck chunin vest. Another shoes needed a little more work, and two needed haircuts. You could barely see their scalps under the quarter-inch hair. All in all, there wasn't much to be displeased with. Everyone would have passed a normal inspection, but this wasn't a normal institution, and normal rules didn't apply. Yoshiro was not a screamer. He'd got past that. His remonstrations were more fatherly now. They carried the force of a command from God nevertheless. He finished the inspection and dismissed the guard detail to allow them to move on to their patrols. Though he didn't know it, he was about to have a very interesting day. At the same time, in the Kumo safe house, Kanoha, Shigeo assembled the mercenaries he had hired and assigned them their duties. Although, he and Nakamura were the only illegal agents present in Kanoha, they couldn't afford to get reckless. These men were disposable thugs, lured with the task of making some easy money, and as such they had been tasked with creating a diversion, which he would use to accomplish his mission. Rinji? Yes, Shigeo-san. Rinji Aburai, known as Rinji, hadn't stopped going over the maps and photographs of the targets since he had entered the safe house. One of the most experienced assassins in the Nukneen world, hiring him hadn't been that easy, but it was worth it. Shigeo planned to use him as the main diversion-making aspect of his plan, thereby allowing him to conduct his task. Assassinating a man of high Shihuga's caliber wasn't an easy task after all. Exactly at twenty past ten, you understand? Hi. Near the Uchiha Military Police HQ, time ten o'clock. The watch in front of the police HQ changed at ten, and the new guard on station was young Inabi Uchiha, the nephew of Sergeant Yashiro Uchiha. As such, he was rather over-enthusiastic in his duty, hoping to one day make a name for himself like his renowned relatives Uchiha Shursue and Uchiha Itachi. As such, caught in the trappings of his duty, he remained in the guardhouse, and didn't notice a man walk past the guardhouse and enter a cafe on the opposite side of the street. It was five past ten by then. Fifty feet away, an elderly lady who observed it from a hidden vantage point walked towards the guardhouse and calmly called out Inabi who looked surprised at being called. Yes, madam? Inabi asked in slight curiosity, as he greeted the old woman politely. Well, young man, I would like to ask how you military police can allow a dangerous criminal like that hoodlum over there to walk scot-free? She asked in a chiding tone as Inabi's eyes widened. What criminal? What do you mean? The young man asked the old woman who hit him on the head with her handbag. That red-headed man sitting over there by the window. Honestly, you young boys are all so inept. I am going to complain to Fugakakuin, she trilled as she waved her hands and pointed towards Renji who was sitting near the window calmly sipping a cup of tea. And Nabi was now scared. If this old bat knew the clan head and complained, then his career would end before it began. Please wait here, madam, the young man spoke hastily as he ran inside to call his uncle. As the young man ran inside, the old woman walked over to a corner and slowly used the shunshin to leave the area, with a thin smirk adorning her face. Niyujito's mission was going to be handled by an agency of the government of Kanahigakur no Sato. Around the same time, near the east gate of the Hyuga Mansion. Meanwhile, near the empty street at the exit near the Hyuga Mansion, Shigeo was waiting impatiently for Hyuga Hayashi to exit the compound. He saw that the man was walking alone without any guards from the branch house accompanying him as well. What luck! We will never get a better chance than this. The Kumo agent spoke to himself and waited patiently for the man to stop speaking with the guards at the gate, and to move a bit further. After a couple of minutes, the man finished speaking with the guards and moved out. About bloody time, Shigeo growled as he finally saw the man walk out. In his hurry and excitement, he didn't notice the one minor thing that could have saved his life. The man he was targeting was wearing a forehead protector, but it was known universally that Hyuga Hayashi never wore a forehead protector, ever. Because of his misjudgment, things were about to take a very drastic turn in the future. Why the hell is he so late? Shigeo growled as he and his men got ready. He is a clan head boss, sometimes these things happen, one of the men he had hired opined, for which he was rewarded with a glare. Let's roll. It was ten past ten. In front of the Yumpy HQ, ten twelve. Well, where is that old lady? Yoshiro asked in irritation as he was dragged out of his office by his nephew, Inabi. She she's gone, damn it. The old crone said she knew the captain, she must have gone to complain to the captain, and Nabi swore as the older man raised his eyebrows. Well, where is this so-called criminal that she wanted off the streets? Yoshiro asked sarcastically, at which Anabi pointed out Rinji, who was still sitting in the cafe drinking tea as if nothing had happened. As Yoshiro looked at the man, his eyes went so wide that his eyebrows rose into his hairline. Rinji Aburai, what the fuck is that asshole doing here? How the hell did he get inside Kanoha in the first place? Yoshiro wondered out loud as Anabi loosened the flap of his holster seeing the look on his uncle's face. You, 
he called out to a patrolman who was standing guard at the gate, and dragged him aside. Go and get the entire department outside, now, he ordered as the terrified patrolman ran inside. What do you mean by the entire department? And now be asked in shock as he eyed his uncle who brought out his fully matured Sharingan. Seriously, was that red-haired dude such a big deal? Had the old crone been correct? Was he some sort of super criminal? Inabi would never know the magnitude of his error. Everybody, now. The older man nearly screamed as few passers-by stopped and looked at the old man in surprise. Fortunately, Rinji missed that altercation. Unfortunately, that would be the cause of his death. Inabi, go get your sway, now. I want him here ASAP. Yashiro ordered Inabi who vanished instantly in a shunshin. Five minutes later, Rinji Aburai found himself surrounded by Uchiha Shursue, Uchiha Yashiro, and the entire Uchiha military police while the frightened patrons of the cafe scrambled away. He looked at the time. It was twenty past ten. He had caused the diversion all right, only it had not gone in the way he had intended. At the same time, near the Hyuga mansion. As the Hyuga clan head walked ahead, suddenly, five flash tags erupted in front of him, blinding him for a scant second. At that moment, an exploding tag went off in front of him, and he was blown back, broken and clearly bleeding. As Shigeo and his men prepared to flee the area, they noticed a commotion at the Hyuga Gate. He nearly had a heart attack when he saw the Hyuga clan head and a few members of the Hyuga clan race towards them and the downed man. Two of them? What was? He didn't have any time to think, as he vanished using the Shunshin leaving his hired thugs to deal with the Hyugas. As he reappeared inside the safe house, he was further shocked to his core when he saw Nakamura and Yujito teleport away using the one-time reverse summoning seal. Just as she disappeared, Yujito gave him a cheery wave, and that moment, Shigeo realized that he had been screwed, by someone he had considered his inferior. When Hyuga Hayashi noticed his twin brother being brought down by an explosion created by what appeared to be a group of assassins, he raced forward abandoning all pretenses. The ringleader vanished using a shunshin, but his men were still there, and one of them had withdrawn a sword and was about to plunge it into Hizashi's bleeding head. He never got the chance. Hayashi's juken strike blew his heart right out of his body through a spectacular shower of blood, erupting out of his back like a fountain, and it fell on the ground still beating before it stilled while the man crashed down, deader than a stone. The rest of the thugs went down like moths in a flame against the other Hyuga clan members, and it was all over, as quickly as it began. The ANBU squad that teleported in, was treated to a rare sight. The Hyuga clan head and his men were trying to stabilize a wounded man, who upon inspection was revealed to be his brother. They grimaced. This was going to be a real shitstorm. They began to move out and scan the area for residual explosives and also any stragglers who might have stayed back to watch the proceedings. And when they did, they found out that the backlash of the explosion had killed some of the civilians who were walking on the other side of the road as well. They swore. This was definitely not a good day. Damn, and the mess hall had prepared a feast in the honor of the new Hokage's arrival as well too, and it would seem that they would miss it. The guy who did this was in for a shitload and half of trouble. Ibiki would tear them a new one over this, in the absence of Kakashi, and the new Hokage was due to arrive today Jesus, and this was not how they intended to make a good impression on her, was it? Yep, things were pretty bad, all right. However, all of them would soon realize that things were going to be much worse in the next few hours, before they got better. Half an hour later, UMPHQ, interrogation block. Renji Aburai was brought into the interrogation room, bound hand to foot, and was surrounded by three of the Uchiha clan members who would act as interrogators for this mission. Uchiha Yashiro, Uchiha Shursue, and Uchiha Inabi. Well, let us start, Inabi, the greenhorn spoke out as Yashiro scowled at him. We wait for the ANBU to arrive, it is standard procedure. Three policemen and an ANBU, besides this scumbag is actually big enough to warrant an ANBU presence, the sergeant scowled as he eyed the prisoner distastefully. Just then, the doors opened and Figaku Uchiha, the head of the military police walked in, flanked by an ANBU operative. So, what gives, gentlemen? The captain asked without preamble as he looked at his subordinates. Shursue looked towards Yashiro who nodded and began. Sir, guardsman Inabi Uchiha here was accosted by a senior citizen who lodged a complaint against this here individual. Her complaint was rather vociferous, and since the subject was unknown to him, Inabi here, called me in to report. I identified him as Rinji Aburai, B-ranked nuke Nin operating out of Takigakir and the Land of Wood. So, we brought him in and so far he has declined to speak with us, sir, Yashiro made his formal report. What did he have on him? The ANBU asked quietly. Well, sir, he was loaded with a shitload of explosive tags, so we presume he was here to cause a major terrorist act, upon the orders of his contractors, along with Kanai, Shuriken and some poison gas pellets, you know, the basic shit, the sergeant scowled. All right, Abrai-san, can you please state your objective in coming here, please? 
This might go a long way in mitigating your sentence, the ANBU operative who was wearing a cat mask spoke curtly. Rinji continued to give him the silent treatment. The ANBU sighed, look pal, I am doing this for your own good, all right. Otherwise, it is the ANBU interrogation cells for you. You better start talking pal, the ANBU are in a shitty mood tonight. There ain't a dude alive who wants to mess with the Biki Marino today. You would be safer with, say Orochimaru, than with him. I am doing this for your own good, believe it, the man spoke softly as the eyes of the Uchihas who were watching narrowed in suspicion. What do you mean, sir? Yoshiro Uchiha asked quietly. His senses were tingling badly and the old policeman knew that it was not a good sign. He had a hunch that something had gone wrong, and his hunches were usually correct, most of the time. Somebody tried to off Yuga Hayashi, just some time ago, but they missed and got his twin brother instead, and they messed that up as well, and blew some civilians along the way too. The Hugas took out all the assassins except one dude, who got away. The village is in lockdown as of now on orders from the Hokage. The NBU on patrol are real pissed. You better start praying buddy, because if you don't talk, I got no problems in handing you over to Ibiki you dig? You know about Ibiki Marino right? The ANBU asked quietly as Rinji gulped. He knew who Ibiki was all right, he was the boogeyman of the new Kneen operating around Kanoha. You serious? And Nabi asked with his jaws wide open while even Shursue stared in curiosity at the ANBU. However, the look of stony silence on Fugaku's face confirmed it. It was serious, all right. Suddenly, Yashiro connected the dots. Sir, you might want to call in Ibiki-san, after all. We caught this dude around the time this shit got pulled off. And he was wired to cause some major damage, which would have made a nice diversion for that shit. Maybe he is a part of this shindig, and maybe he was hired to do that very thing, to help those assassins get away, Yashiro spoke rapidly, while Rinji began to sweat. Wait a minute, is that true, pal? Because if it is, you are in real deep shit sunny, you better tell me something. If you want to save your ass, the NBU spoke gruffly as he glared at Rinji but Rinji still remained silent. Well, looks like we might have to call in Ibiki-san. After all, the NBU rose when Inabi stopped him. Everyone turned to look at the rookie, who signaled them to be silent. Inbiu-san, you say that the Hyuga head was attacked, but they missed and got his brother, right? If that is the case, then let us hand this shithead over to the Hyuga clan. I mean they have got real motive to get the truth out of this guy. It is their clan these assholes hid after all, the youngster spoke softly, while Rinji became dead still which did not go unnoticed by the others. Catching on to his nephew's game, Yashiro retorted, You out of your mind, boy? The mood they are in currently, those Hugas will eat this punk alive. You want that on your conscience? He asked in a growl while everybody became silent. Yes, I think your idea has merit, and Nabi, Fugaku spoke for the first time as the others nodded gingerly as well. Seeing that, Renji finally broke. Ten minutes later, the UMP and the ANBU had the address of Shigeo's safe house in their hands. Another five minutes later, Renji Aburai, Nuke Nin, was declared officially dead in the records of the Uchiha Military Police. Kanoha Medical Center, one hour after the attack. Hayashi Hyuga charged through the entrance of the shock trauma center and identified himself at the reception desk, whose occupant directed him to a waiting room where, she said firmly, he would be notified as soon as there was anything to report. The sudden change from action to inaction disoriented Hayashi enormously. He stood at the entrance of the waiting room for some minutes, his mind a total blank as it struggled with the situation. The shock trauma center, dubbed as the first response to all major medical emergencies, had begun at the end of the Second War as the dream of a brilliant, aggressive and supremely arrogant medic now known worldwide as Senju Tsunade, the greatest medical ninja of all time. The department had bludgeoned its way forward by cutting a bloody swath through all bureaucratic and political hurdles, sometimes literally, to emerge as the pinnacle of medical expertise in the entire world. It had blossomed into a dazzling, legendary success. Shock trauma was the leading edge of emergency medical technology, and the best medic, Nin came out of this division. It had already pioneered many techniques for critical care, and in doing so had brutally overthrown many historical precepts of conventional medicine, which had not endeared its founder to her medical brethren. That would have been true in any field, and shock trauma's founder had not helped the process any by her acerbic and outspoken opinions. Her greatest, but unacknowledged, crime, of course, was being right in nearly all details. And while she had left, dejected, after suffering from the death of her fiancé, in her absence, that department still stood as a monument of testimony to her brilliance in the medical field. Shock trauma assignment was the dream of every aspiring medic in the village. But will they be good enough? Hayashi asked himself. He lost all track of time, waiting, afraid to look at the time, afraid to speculate on the significance of time's flight. He reflected upon the events remembering that in his arrogance, blinded by his position, he had ignored his brother, who was now battling for his life. He was not ignorant, and he realized that it was he who had been targeted, 
but it was his brother who had paid the price. His brother had been dealt a raw hand by fate. A few seconds of difference, and it might have been so that he would have switched roles with his brother. That humbled him, making him realize the pain and suffering his brother underwent on a daily basis, and it made him feel helpless and ashamed. For the first time, he cursed the tradition of his own clan which wantonly bifurcated family as if they were mere playthings. Saratobi, who watched the clan head from a side, shook his head in sorrow. He had seen such things happen, far too many times, but they hurt all the same. Soon, the door opened, and a medic came in. Hayashi-sama, I am here to tell you the condition of your brother, he spoke as he looked at the distraught Hyuga clan head. Your brother is in critical condition, the man spoke bluntly, seeing no way out of explaining the mess. Hayashi nearly choked with his next breath. We have been working on him for the past five hours. We had to remove the spleen. That's okay, you can live without the spleen. The medic didn't mention that the spleen was an important part of the body's defense against infection, and continued. The liver had a moderately extensive stellate fracture and damage to the main artery that feeds blood into the organ. We had to remove about a quarter about the liver. Again, there is no problem with that, and I think we fixed the arterial damage, and I think the repair will hold. The liver is important. It has a great deal to do with blood formation and the body's biochemical balance. You can't live without it. If liver function is maintained, he'll probably make it. As for the rest, the explosion caused many cracks in the bone structures, but they are easy to heal. Same thing with the shrapnel. We removed them all, and healed the damage caused by them. The man stopped as he rubbed his forehead. It all depends on the liver. If it continues to work, he will survive. We are keeping a very close watch on the blood chemistry, and will know more in another ten hours, sir. He finished his report and bowed and left, leaving a thoroughly shaken brother behind. Hayashi, a voice came behind him, and the man turned around to see the sandame. Do not worry, Hayashi. Tsunade will be arriving in a few hours, and I will ask her to handle this case, personally. The Hokage spoke quietly and instantly. The man let out a deep sigh. If Tsunade were to get involved, then his brother would make it. However, I am here for another reason. The Sandame continued as he looked at the feeling of relief that appeared on the man's face. We have discovered the hideout of the assassin who has done this, the Hokage concluded. Hayashi's eyes narrowed, Hokage-sama, I would like to be involved in this, the head of the Hyuga clan spoke in a cold tone. Of course, I will be conducting the takedown personally, the Sandame spoke in a genial tone masked by a steely visage, becoming very much the professor, as he was known. Kumo's safe house, six hours after the attack. Within the safe house, Shigeo rapidly analyzed the situation. He had a blown up and was now stranded in enemy territory without any assistance. The situation was bleak. He rapidly began to salvage around the safe house, to find anything that could aid him. He had to abandon the safe house as soon as possible, because he knew that the Kanoha ninja would find it out within the next few hours. They were annoyingly good at such things. His eyes burned fiercely as he remembered Yujito's cheery wave weight. What the hell was she doing here? Shouldn't she be in Kumo? Don't ever ever call that whore as Yujito-sama in my presence, you understand? The memory of him threatening Nakamura came unbidden in his mind. Nakamura that son of a bitch had ratted him out. Shigeo growled and punched out the wall in frustration. Nakamura was a rookie who had been assigned to this mission from Yujito's platoon, because the mission specs had been originally drawn by Yujito, but he had suborned Nakamura forcibly to conduct the mission in his chosen manner, abandoning Yujito's plans. And that rat-faced bastard had ratted out on him to her. She was the one who had sabotaged his mission as a reply to his insubordination. That conniving bitch. He realized that his career was now over. An illegal identified by an enemy nation would never be accepted back in his home village. If he managed to escape, he would be forced to be a new Kneen, because Kumovicure could not give asylum to a wanted fugitive, and since Kumo and Kanoha were not at war publicly, he would not be a prisoner of war, but considered as a new Kneen and methods of dealing with new Kneen were much harsher than with Paus. Also, revenge against Yujito was out of the question. Even though he was a pathological male chauvinist, subconsciously, even he realized that he would never be a match for the Jinchuriki of the Nibi no Nikomata. But I will not forget this, Yujito, you will pay for your treachery. Meanwhile, outside the safe house, a different scenario was playing out. More than fifteen squads of the ANBU were now surrounding the house, with five of them maintaining close perimeter watch, while the UMP had cleared out all civilians and set up an external perimeter watch. This mission had taken a very serious nature indeed with the Hokage himself supervising the takedown aided by the Hyuga clan head, and the ANBU knew what it meant. Their commander was away on a mission, and therefore the Hokage had stepped in personally. Failure was not an option, not in this case. It seems that he is alone, Hokage-sama, the walls are laced with anti-intrusion seals, as well as a proximity alarm seal, and is overlaid with a level 7 trap seal, one of the ANBU reported as he bowed down. 
Hmm, the Hokage mused as he stroked his beard. What do you think, Hayashi? The Hokage asked the opinion of the Hyuga clan head who looked at the building calculatively. It would seem that he holds the advantage inside the safe house. We have no idea of what the interior defenses are, or how many people are inside if there is more than one person inside that is, and if they have gone to such lengths to apply basic exterior defenses, then I believe our only option would be to flush him slash them out. Hayashi spoke gutturally. Yes, I surmised as much, the Sandame nodded. Would you do the honors? The old man asked genially. My pleasure, Hayashi nodded as he activated his Byakugan, with veins bulging at the side of his eyes. As soon as the proximity seal on the safe house sensed the Byakugan trying to interfere with the anti-intrusion seal to breach the anti-visual obstruction ward, a number of things happened simultaneously. Shigeo who was inside the house, instantly became alert as alarms blazed, and realizing that his hideout was blown, he moved to activate the countermeasures. The basic countermeasure for a safe house in enemy territory, which when discovered was to destroy it and all sensitive materials inside. As such, he raced to the basement knowing that he had scant seconds before the Kanoha ANBU would storm him. It was a drill he had practiced many times. He took a demolition charge and placed it in the middle of a room, whose walls were plastered with explosive tags. He took the charge and attached it to a random tag, and prepared to set a time-delayed seal. However, he had not anticipated one thing, Yujito. The resourceful woman, before bugging out of Kanoha, had left a farewell present for him, which he hadn't anticipated. She had saturated the sealed chakra within the explosive tags by a liberal dosage of the Nibi no Nikomata's chakra, and the demolition charge was 10 kilograms of TNT. It made for a rather explosive combination. Shigeo, who was unaware of this, rapidly attached the demolition charge to an explosive tag and activated the time-delayed fusion sequence for detonation when something caught his notice. He instantly paled as he realized what that meant. Yujito had screwed him one final time, again. When Shigeo saw the explosive tags turn blue, he knew that he was critically short on time. He rapidly made seals for the Shunshin, praying that he make it before he blew himself up. He made it, although barely. The 10 kilograms of TNT combined with the supercharged explosive tags laced with the chakra of the Nibi no Nikomata combusted, and created an explosion that roared out of the basement with a sound like the end of the world, and exploded virulently. The building exploded like a glass bottle, sending out a hailstorm of shrapnel in all directions. The five ANBU squads maintaining proximity watch were shredded instantly to nothing. Saratobi leapt into the fray and put forth all his chakra and raised a massive barrier and saved the lives of everybody else. Once the explosion abetted, the eyes of the remaining Kanoha ninja turned murderous. He is escaping, he is making to the gates, but he seems to be severely injured Hayashi, whose Byakugan could look from one end of Kanoha to another, reported after scanning the entire village in mere seconds. To the gates, Saratobi roared as he vanished in a blazing shunshin. Nearly, a hundred ninja followed their leader, intent on catching the murderous terrorist. At the village gates, Shigeo knew he was dying. The explosion had incinerated his left arm to ashes, and he was badly burnt. He was having difficulty breathing, and blood raced down his sides, freely splattering the ground. Despite all this, one name was constantly ringing in his mind. Yujito Betrayal. As he neared the gate, he realized that he would not even make it out of the gate before he perished. He was losing too much blood, and too many of his internal organs had been damaged, to keep his body functioning properly. Suddenly, his peripheral vision caught sight of a blonde woman and her entourage at the gate. Yujito, so you are here to watch me die, bitch demon whore. With a yell, the dying man roared and charged at the blonde woman, who looked surprised and taken aback. However, that did not stop her from retaliating. She drew her hand back and delivered a mighty punch, cleanly detaching his head from his body. Sarutobi and his men, who were pursuing the enemy ninja stopped to watch the strange scene, mesmerized. The blonde woman at the gate had dealt a single punch which had cleanly detached the enemy's head. They all watched as the man's head sailed through the air like a football, passing at least 200 yards from the gate, before falling down to ground and rolling around until it came to a stop near Saratobi's feet. Well, that was rather anticlimactic, Hayashi spoke curtly with his eye twitching lightly as he eyed the head of the man who had tried to kill his brother rolled down near his feet. Who the heck is she? And Nabi Uchiha, who was in the pursuit squad, asked with fear laced in his tone. He was not the only one who was scared like that. Most of the people in the pursuit squad were eyeing the blonde woman apprehensively, and with no small amount of fear. Did you see that? Holy shit man! She punched his head off as if it was made of paper. Damn. That's a real scary chick. I bet she is single. The clamor and noises stopped when Saratobi raised his hand, and after they fell silent, the Hokage spoke with a small smile on his face. It would seem that the new Hokage has arrived in Kanoha rather quickly after all. Chapter 4, Interlude, 
Tsunade's counsel woes. The courtesy of Kanoha seems to have lessened as of late, Saratobi-sensei. This is quite a welcome, Tsunade spoke curtly as she eyed all the shinobi standing near the other side of the gates, with a raised eye. An awkward silence fell over the area, as most of the ninja present lowered their eyes in apparent shame. One man one man had led them on a merry chase all around and had caused all this devastation, and yet despite their best efforts, the new Hokage who was entering the village for the first time had had to take care of the problem personally. It was quite a devastating blow to the pride and egos of all the ninja present in the area. The new Hokage had arrived at the village and after seeing their performance, had found them wanting not how they had imagined welcoming her, definitely not. Much has happened today Tsunade, and not all of it has been good, I must admit, Saratobi spoke in a reproachful tone, as he looked at her, as if he was admonishing her for her sarcastic tone. I can see that, Tsunade admitted, as she took a good look around. Looks like an enemy raid, although its execution seems to have been shoddy. So, who was it Kumogakure? Tsunade asked as she moved in, while her entourage followed her quietly. It would appear so, although we cannot be certain, another voice came out, and all of the people present turned to see the three elders of the village, Hamura Midokado, Yudatane Koharu, and Danza walk in towards the area of disturbance. Hamura, who had been the one to speak, continued, It is good to see you again, Tsunade, although, I do wish that the circumstances were different, the old man spoke softly as he eyed the new Hokage. Regardless of this, the announcement must be made. Genma, hate, announced to the villagers that the new Hokage has arrived, and has dealt with the situation personally. The villagers need to be assured that the situation is under control, Kohara ordered curtly, as the two jonin instantly bowed and vanished. It is good to see that the new Hokage can act forcefully when needed. Welcome back, Tsunadeheim, Danzo spoke in a curt, but polite tone as he looked at her. Tsunade nodded curtly at the old man, and looked at her teacher. Well, Saratobi-sensei, shall we get on with the matters at hand? I had planned on taking some rest, but it seems that I have gotten myself involved in this mess. So, do you wish to handle this, or should I? She asked wanly as she looked around. You are the Godain now, Tsunade, even though you have not yet taken over. I am the Hokage and only name, as of now. Deal with it, as you will, Saratobi spoke in a pleased tone, happy that his student was no longer willing to shirk her duties as of before. All right, guess I am back in business then, Tsunade spoke out loudly so that everyone could hear her. The new Hokage had arrived and was now in charge. Kakashi, she barked loudly as Kakashi stood at attention, Jiraiya must be around here somewhere. Take your squad with you and find him, and bring him to the Hokage Tower, and do whatever it takes to do so. Tell that pervert that if he doesn't agree, I will be upset, she spoke with a beautiful smile on her face, at which Kakashi and many other men gulped in fear. Kakashi and his squad vanished instantly as Tsunade looked at them pointedly, choosing wisely to escape her ire. Next, Tsunade continued in the same authoritative tone. When she took charge, she really took charge, I want the village under lockdown, no one gets in and no one gets out. I want the ANBU manning the perimeter of the village and I want any who try to violate that order arrested and interrogated, she spoke swiftly as most of the ANBU present bowed and vanished. Shizen, I want you to go to the medical center and take charge, and deal with all the injuries. Ah, uh, Fugaku, you are here, good good, I want the military police to arrest all the visitors and tourists in the village, have them detained and questioned regardless of their nationality and status. I don't care if they have diplomatic immunity. And start with the Lightning Country Ambassador as well as the Kumo Diplomat. Move, she ordered curtly as Fugaka nodded and left, although he seemed to be rather apprehensive. Shizen threw a tremulous look at her master as she left as well. Tsunade, that could cause a diplomatic incident perhaps, Kohara began when Tsunade raised her hand to stop the old woman. I have been traveling for five days, I am tired, I am sore and I just had to take down an enemy myself, something which you people failed at. Now is not the time for niceties, and I don't give a damn what happens. Someone attacked us, and me, and I want to know who they were, and I will. I don't care what I have to do to get the answers. Saratobi-sensei, let us go, the irate blonde woman spoke harshly as the eyes of the counselors went wide, although Danzo had a look of approval on his face. Looks like she has changed and for the better this is a welcome surprise. Reha, come, she beckoned to the young man standing at the corner in an imperious tone, and for the first time, the eyes of the counselors and the remaining ninja fell upon the young man who was standing at the corner, observing everything silently. Kohara and Hamura, who along with Saratobi, had been the students of Toborama, did not take long to notice the resemblance, and neither did Danzo. The boy was of medium height, and had a lithe build. If not for the brown markings on his face, at the bottom of his chin, he would have had a perfectly androgynous look. Dressed in all white, and carrying that sword strapped at his back, the young man looked like a younger version of the Naidain Hokage although there were some noticeable differences in the facial structure. Reihakun, it is good to see you again. 
These old eyes have missed you. I am afraid this village will have need of you before long, my boy, Saratobi spoke in a genial tone as he moved towards the boy. Saratobi Jasama, it is good to see you again. I am glad to see you in good health, the young man spoke in a monotone voice, while his face showed no expressions at all. Saratobi laughed at that. Tsunade, who is this boy and why does he look like? Kohara began as she looked the boy once over and stopped as she looked at the face of Tsunade expectantly. Tsunade sighed, knowing that she was in for a major tongue lashing by the counselors, and continued, His name is Reha. He is my grandson, well, technically grandnephew, I suppose. He is the great-grandson of Toburamo Tuji, and I have been raising him in secret all these years, she concluded in a wan tone as the boy made a formal bow to the three elders. What? Tsunade! Kohara screeched as she looked at the younger woman with incensed eyes. How could you keep such a thing like this secret from us? Us? She again spoke with added emphasis on the word. Yes, Hamura added, with his face also coloring up, this is not something to be kept secret from the Goikenban. The village has a right to know such important secrets. To think that the Senju clan has had an heir, and you, of all people, kept that a secret from us. And Saratobi, how could you? We are the students of Toburama sensei as well. How could you not inform us of this? Why? The man asked with a rather pained look on his face, while Saratobi bowed his head down in apology. Enough! Tsunade roared, as the two counselors composed themselves, although their eyes were still mutinous, this is neither the place nor the proper time to discuss this. Now move! She all but roared while the two elders nodded stiffly, although still looking mutinous. Reha, Tsunade called out, and the boy stiffened as he replied, Grandmother, please go ahead, I shall join you shortly, he spoke out in a stiff tone, at which Tsunade looked him once over, and nodded stiffly. Don't take too long, she warned as she left with the elders who gave a curious glance at the boy. Do not worry, Godame sama I shall escort him personally to the towers, Hayashi who was standing at the side spoke out at which Tsunade nodded curtly in agreement. As soon as she was out of earshot, the whisperings began. Did you hear that? Yeah, her grandson, whoa. The great-grandson of the Nidame, wow. The last male sends you, hot damn, wait till the others hear this. Ignoring all this, Reha made his way towards the medic team which was busy in bagging Shigeo's corpse with Hayashi following him silently. Please desist for a while, the boy spoke curtly, but firmly, and the medics having heard the exchange of the Hokage and the elders, nodded respectfully and stepped back. As soon as he neared the man's corpse which had been put together by the medics, Reha knelt down and brought a scroll out of his pouch and spread it open on the ground. Hayashi opted to remain silent and watch the newly revealed Senju boy do his work. Reha rapidly began to flash through a number of seals, and when he finished, the three middle fingers of his right hand began to glow, and he placed them on the forehead of Shigeo's corpse. Senju Hijitsu, Kinen Ishiku, Senju Hidden Technique, Memory Transplant, he uttered the name of the technique as various symbols and characters began to form on the corpse's forehead, and began to move into his three glowing fingers. After some minutes, he stopped and withdrew the three glowing fingers and placed them on the empty scroll. Immediately, the characters which had entered his glowing fingers reappeared and began to rearrange themselves on the scroll, until they filled three quarters of it. After which, he rolled up the scroll and looked at the medics, you may dispose of this corpse, he informed the medics who nodded, hi, Ray Hadano, and with that, they took the corpse away. Reha turned to look towards Haishi, and spoke, I am sorry, that we have not been introduced yet, good sir. My name is Senju Reha, and you are, he asked quietly as he looked at the Hyuga clan head. My name is Hyuga Hayashi, Reha-san. I am the head of the Hyuga clan. Pleased to meet you, the man proffered his hand, which the young man clasped and let go very quickly after a brief shake. Shall we proceed to the Hokage Tower? Reha asked as the Hyuga head nodded and began to move forward with the youngster following him. If I may ask, what was it that you did? I have never seen a technique like this before, Hayashi asked quietly as Reha replied curtly, You shall know at the tower, I shall reveal everything there, please wait until we are at the presence of the new Hokage, the young man spoke in a polite tone, and a miffed Hayashi nodded in agreement. Rather curious as he eyed the enigmatic youngster. Unacceptable. There is no excuse for this. How do you justify yourself, Tsunade? You had no right to hide the existence of the boy. Kohara spoke harshly as she eyed the younger woman. The old woman was quite upset at learning that her sensei had a descendant, and was incensed that she had not been informed of it. The men in the room watched the interaction quietly, not wanting to interfere. Both women were known to have explosive tempers and none of them wanted to get caught in the backlash. And Sarutobi? How could you? I thought we were colleagues, friends, and yet you kept the existence of the legacy of our sensei a secret, even from us? How could you? The old woman turned her eye on the sandame who began to fidget. Enough. Tsunade roared and smashed her fist onto the desk of the Hokage which crumbled to pieces at her onslaught. 
the elders, too shocked to retort, just eyed her in surprise. Your opinions have no weight with me. As Reha's only living relative and elder, as well as being the person who has raised him, I alone possess the right to decide what should be done with regards to his upbringing. The matters of my personal family are not the concern of the Goiken ban. Do I make myself clear? Tsunade growled as she eyed the elders who looked very offended. Am I clear? Tsunade growled as she looked at the three elders who nodded stiffly. Kohara sat down with a huff and crossed her arms as she glared at the younger woman. Guess I can't talk her down like I used to. When she was younger, the old woman snorted as she looked at the new Hokage. I think they got the message, Tsunade. A chuckle came near the windows, and everybody turned to see Jiraiya perched on the windowsill. Still, may we at least know the reason why his existence was kept secret? Hamura asked in a more reasonable tone as he eyed the blonde woman. I wanted him to have a normal upbringing, that is all, Tsunade spoke softly as she looked at the three elders who had incredulous looks on their faces. And you couldn't provide that in this village, where he could have had everything at his disposal? You decided to raise the last living male heir of the Senju clan in a remote forest, because you wanted him to be normal? I am afraid I don't understand your reasoning, Tsunade, Kohara spoke shrilly as she eyed the younger woman in disbelief. This is exactly what I meant. If I had raised him in the village, the villagers and the people here would have pampered him, and spoiled him, because of who he is. Famous before he could walk and talk, all because of his heritage. It would have turned any child's head around, and would have turned him into an arrogant and egotistical person, and I didn't wish that to happen. Do not deny it, you know what happens to the so-called prodigies from bloodline clans, who are pampered and spoiled beyond limits, just because of their heritage. I did not wish that upon him, Tsunade spoke curtly as the ire of the elders deflated slightly. Not to mention that it would have made him in an instant target to the rest of the world. Every hidden village in the world would have sent their agents to either kidnap him or to eliminate him. After all, the potential of the Senju clan is known to the entire world, is it not? Sarutobi asked in a reasonable tone and the ire of the elders deflated further, as they grudgingly accepted the words of the Sandame Hokage. Fine, Kohara conceded, but we will be having words later, Sarutobi, she spoke in a steely tone as she eyed the Hokage, with the promise of much more tongue lashing in the future while Sarutobi winced at the thought. If you have decided to reveal the boy's existence, Danzo spoke for the first time, it must mean that he is now capable of defending himself from any sort of threat. Just what sort of abilities does the boy possess? He asked quietly as he glanced at the new Hokage. He will surpass Sakumo in another three years, Jiraiya spoke bluntly, at which the three elders shot up in their chairs so fast that it appeared as if they had used the Horation itself to stand up. Looking at the silent looks of confirmation on the faces of Tsunade and Sarutobi, they slowly sat down as their minds came to terms with the thoughts. Heh, I guess that the Senju blood does run true after all, Danzo spoke in a soft tone with a small chuckle while the other two elders remained silent and poker-faced. When will he joy? Hamura began when the door opened and Reha and Hayashi entered the chambers. All talk stopped as Sonata introduced him to the elders as the boy bowed down in greeting to them. All of them relocated to a small table at the end of the room, as Sonata had smashed the desk in her outburst and sat down while a secretary brought in some refreshments and served them all and walked out with a quick bow. Heh, not even two minutes on the job, and she has already broken a desk, must be a new record, Jiraiya smirked as he eyed the room, and more importantly, the new Hokage. After everyone had settled down, Reha took out the scroll which he had prepared and placed it in front of Tsunade, Grandmother, this scroll contains all the details of what has transpired in the village today, he spoke curtly as he stood in a corner in rigid attention, while the jaws of the elders fell open. What? But how, that technique didn't Hayashi began to protest as Tsunade raised her hand and stopped him mid-tirade. Indeed. The investigations have not even begun yet, how could you have, Kohara began as she looked at the boy in apprehension. Reha, please explain to them, Tsunade ordered as she closed her eyes with a sigh after realizing what the boy had done. The technique that I used is a hijitsu passed through the Senju clan for generations. It is a variation of the Yamanaka hijitsu, and when used, it transcribes all the memories of a dead person into a scroll thereby giving a detailed account of all his memories in the last seven days. As such, I used the technique on the corpse of the intruder who was terminated by grandmother at the village gates, and I have compiled the events of his memories of the last seven days, Reha spoke in a drab monotone, while the eyes of the elders went wide. Even Jiraiya, Hayashi and Saratobi were surprised. Impressive, most impressive, Danzo admitted softly as he evaluated the youngster quietly. I don't have time to read this now, I will look at it later, just give me a brief summarization. Tsunade ordered him, at which he nodded. The dead man was an illegal agent of Kumogakure, and he had indeed been ordered to assassinate Hyuga Hayashi-san, however, his operation was sabotaged by his own superiors, Reha spoke curtly at which even Tsunade's eyes narrowed. What does that mean? 
Koharu spoke in surprise as she tried to assimilate the facts. It means that not everything is hunky-dory in the Kuma forces, Jiraiya spoke wanly. Internal dissension, perhaps, Saratobi spoke out in speculation at which Reha nodded in agreement. That indeed appears to be the case. Apparently, the person in charge of this mission was a female shinobi, and it would seem that this man chafed at being under the authority of a female, and as such, decided to disobey the female superior's orders and proceeded to conduct the operation in his own way, ignoring his orders. As a reply to his insubordination, his female superior sabotaged his operation, resulting in the mayhem that has occurred, Reha concluded as the eyes of the elders narrowed. Jiraiya whistled, quite a feisty female. I don't recall ever hearing of a female shinobi in Kumogakyu who has enough clout to be assigned on such a sensitive mission, no offense Hayashi. Jiraiya spoke warmly as he eyed Hayashi who jerked his head narrowly in acceptance. Did you get any names worth salvaging? Tsunade asked after a moment as she contemplated the information that was given. Only four, Shigeo, the deceased's name, Rinji Aburai, a hired mercenary, Nakamura, another illegal who seems to have been residing in Kanoha as a sleeper agent, and Yujito, the aforementioned female. Nakamura and Yujito seem to have been the ones responsible for the sabotage, before they escaped to Kumogakure, Reha concluded. And you got all this information, through one technique? Hamura asked in surprise at which Reha nodded. The technique that I used, through judicious use of a combination of fuinjutsu and human anatomical knowledge, transcribes all the memories of a deceased person into the medium chosen to transcribe the details upon. Unless specifically warded, all the memories residing in the brain will be copied, transformed and transcribed, given the proviso that the brain has suffered no significant damage, Reha concluded at which everyone became silent. Kin and Ishiku, huh? Tsunade asked gruffly at which the young man nodded silently. Well done, Tsunade spoke into a small smile as she looked at him. One more thing, Reha spoke out softly at which everybody turned to look at him, it would appear that this Niyujito is in fact, a Jinchuriki. The Jinchuriki of the Nibi no Nikomata, at least according to the memories of the deceased man. It was as if a nuclear explosion had been set off inside the chamber, as the elders exploded into a cacophony of swearing and curses. To go so far as to use a Jinchuriki against us, that is an act of war, Hamura growled as he banged his fist on the table. There is no way that this was not condoned by the wreckage, such a mission would never have been attempted without his tacit approval. Koharu spoke in a dark tone. As if Killer B was not enough, dear God, Jiraiya sighed softly as he remembered the eccentric Jinchuriki of the Hachibi. Killer B was someone who Jiraiya had no desire to tangle with, ever, apart from Salamander Hanzo. Whatever we do to tackle this can wait until Sonade's inauguration as the Godain tomorrow. We can discuss a proper response after tomorrow, by which time we can corroborate this information from other sources as well, Saratobi spoke out as everybody else nodded. What about the boy? Will he be joining the shinobi forces of Kanoha? Danzo asked quietly, at which the two San Nin and the Sandain began to fidget, while everyone turned to look at Reha. I have some personal obligations to fulfill before that eventuality, Danzo san. Therefore, I will not be joining the shinobi forces of Kanoha until I take care of those personal commitments. Reha spoke curtly at which the three elders jumped to their feet. What? Chapter 5, Prologue, Conflict Arc, Episode 1 One year later. Are you sure that it is feasible, Yujito-san? Gasher, the high jonin of Kumo asked Yujito who nodded emphatically. It is simple in concept, Gasher, all you have to do is get the package to the embassy, and once inside, you are practically as safe as you would be in Kumogakure. Not even Konoha Ninja would dare to assault a diplomatic embassy building in public view. Once inside, use the reverse summoning seal arrays devised by Nakamura and transport the package to Kumo, she spoke softly while Gasher nodded. The new Hokage, Gasher began with a frown when Yujito interrupted him. Will not do anything, in fact she cannot do anything at all, even if she wants to. That is the beauty of this operation, your cover will be your trump card, even if you kill somebody in public view in Kanoha, you will still not be held accountable, Yujito pointed out as Gasher nodded slowly. Even though it was a bit of exaggeration on Yujito's part, the implication was clear. As long as he held to his cover, he was untouchable. The concept was so simple, and yet so daring, he admitted softly. In the turbulent world of Shinobi, Diplomatic mission buildings were the only buildings that were considered inviolate. And to date, despite the numerous shinobi wars, no shinobi village had dared to assault an embassy belonging to an enemy nation, because all nations knew the fact that wars did not last forever, and that there would be an after-the-war scenario, in which all of them would have to re-engage each other. And ambassadors were the only people capable of achieving that. Ambassadors were probably the only politicians most insulated from assassinations, their rulers and masters were targeted, but not them because they were more vital than any others were. Attacking an emissary was considered the ultimate taboo in the shinobi world. In addition, 
if he conducted his mission under the cover of being an ambassador then even if his op was blown, Kanoha would still not dare to attack him, because the repercussions would be severe, Gasher thought smugly, as he nodded his acceptance to the mission, which Yujito had assigned to him. He was wrong, he was very wrong. As the people and ninja of Kanoha watched stupefied, Senju Reha stood atop the roof of the burning embassy of Kaminari no Kuni holding Gasher by his throat. Then, as the horrified civilians and ninja-like watched, he calmly twisted and broke Gasher's neck and threw his corpse down the burning roof to the ground below. A moment later, he vanished as a loud explosion occurred, raising a cloud of dust ten meters high. As it cleared, Reha could be seen walking out of the rubble that was once the embassy of Kaminari no Kuni, and in his arms was the unconscious figure of one Hinata Hyuga the four-year-old daughter of Hyuga Hayashi, whom he handed over to a much-relieved Yuhi Karinai, who hastened to hand over the unconscious child to her father, who was arguing with the council to request permission to assault the embassy of Kaminari no Kuni to reclaim his daughter, something that he wouldn't need to do anymore. As he watched the jubilant cheers arising from the gathered crowd, Nakamura slowly made his way out, deep in thought. For the first time in his life, the man was flustered and rightly so. Disregarding all political ramifications, the Godame Hokage's grandson had single-handedly assaulted the embassy of Kaminari no Kuni to retrieve the kidnapped daughter of the Hyuga clan head, whom the shinobi of Kanoha had seen being taken into the embassy. He cursed Gasher, for the man's incompetence, and the ninja of Kanoha, who had kept the embassy in round-the-clock surveillance. If the idiot Gasher had had the sense to make his way out of Kanoha, instead of going into the embassy gambling on the fact that Kanoha would not assault an embassy, then everything would have gone properly. True, he had been told to use his diplomatic cover as a shield, but that was on the proviso that he maintained his cover intact. The idiot, panicking after realizing that the ninja of Kanoha had discovered that he had kidnapped the girl, had run full tilt into the embassy. Dumbass, there was only so much protection that diplomatic immunity could offer. Kanoha knew they had the girl, and the embassy had been besieged on all sides, and eventually, even if they did manage to get the child back to Kumo, they would have been forced to return her. Now that Kanoha knew that Kumo had violated the integrity of the diplomatic mission, if he had brought the child in undetected, then Kumo would have gained the Byakugan by now. Nevertheless, the idiot had ruined everything. In his panic state, not only had he compromised his cover, he had also dealt a severe blow to Kumo's reputation. By an international treaty between all major shinobi nations, it was decreed that an embassy could not be used for staging shinobi operations. To date, none of the Great Five had violated that agreement. The success of Yujito's plan depended on the very fact that nobody expected them to use this avenue. However, due to the panic reaction of one man, not only had the operation been compromised, but also their reputation was now tarnished forever. What he had truly not expected was the action undertaken by the Hokage's grandson. As soon as the young man had learned of the situation, he had simply blitzed into the embassy single-handed, and had executed Gasher, a fully accredited and recognized ambassador, in full public view. Something, which even Akage, would hesitate twice before doing. He had then systematically executed every person inside the embassy, destroyed the building, and had retrieved the kidnapped girl. From what he had heard, the young man was an extremely shrewd and calculative person, one not prone to giving into impulsive actions like this, and that puzzled him greatly. Nakamura realized without delay that there existed at least one person who had the ability to make life very uncomfortable for Ni Yujito. Moreover, Yujito was not the kind to take to interference in her work in stride. Things were about to get very unpleasant, of that he was sure. As immersed as he was in his thoughts, he did not notice Reha's eyes on him, assessing and calculating his every move. Who the hell do they think they are? I report to the daimyo, and even he is smart enough to not ask me how I do my job. Have you ever seen such a bunch of self-righteous ass covering pricks? They do not care about what we do. They care only about the publicity these things generate, and how the hell could he be so careless? I fight tooth and nail with the Goikenban and allow him to remain a civilian. And how does he repay me? By blowing up an embassy. Is he deranged? Moreover, where the hell is he? In the old days, if one of my ninjas were to act so carelessly, he would have the good sense to defect or become rogue. God, I miss the wars. Tsunade raged as she walked back to her office, while Shizen hurried after her, cringing at the venom in her master's voice. As she neared her office, everybody in the area became quiet sensing that the Godain was in one of her infamous tempers, and wisely opted to remain silent. Tsunade opened the doors of her office, and entered in, only to see her grandson sitting in front of her desk, gazing at the portraits of the previous Hokages. You've got a bloody cheek, Tsunade spoke coldly as she eyed her grandson, who gazed at her indifferently, while Shizen began to chew her nails in anxiety. If not, you had better kill yourself, she retorted coldly as she stared down her grandson, who looked back at her with the same icy indifference. You stormed an embassy, Tsunade pointed out, 
you broke the only absolutely inviolate rule in the area of international relations. Do you have any idea of the damage you have caused? She snarled as she pounded her fist on the table. I did try to mitigate the damage, Reha pointed calmly at which she snorted. You broke a man's neck in full public view and threw him off the roof of that embassy. I would hardly call that showing restraint, especially since that man you killed also happens to be the High Jonin of Kumogikur, who was here as the chief negotiator for the peace talks between our nations. She spoke curtly while Reha's eyebrows rose a tiny bit. I find it hard to believe that you are the one who is lecturing me about restraint, considering who you are and what you did all those years ago, Reha began when Sonate interrupted coldly, utter one more word, and grandson or not, I will have you killed, she finished as the young man nodded and stopped. Frankly speaking, you are overthinking about this matter, in reality, there is nothing they can do, Reha continued while Sonate raised her eyebrows. Really? Care to explain that, grandson mine? First of all, their protests are flimsy at best. I proved it beyond doubt, when I stormed that building and rescued that young Huga child, and an embassy is hardly the place to provide asylum to a fleeing criminal. By blatantly housing a known criminal who had kidnapped the heir of the Huga clan, they stand to lose all credibility. An embassy and its personnel are granted diplomatic immunity from all sorts of prosecution from local laws, in order to create trust between two nations. While it is true that they are granted immunity from most of the laws, that does not give them the right to blatantly violate our laws in such a flagrant manner, and then use their diplomatic immunity as a shield. By storming that embassy, I have saved that child from a terrible fate, and saving an innocent child's life and honor is more important than maintaining a shallow pretense of diplomacy with a treacherous nation. I have also proved that they do not adhere to the principles expected by nations in international relationships, and this incident will further dent their credibility worldwide. And furthermore, as far as accountability for this goes, let me remind you that I am a civilian, and not a ninja under your employ. That is a matter of public record, and it is indisputable. Therefore, if Kaminari no Kuni and Kumogakir intend to hold me accountable, they will find it particularly hard to do so. Especially since, Hai no Kuni and Kaminari no Kuni do not have an extradition treaty and trying to assault me personally would be even more problematic for them, because then they would have assaulted the grandson of the Hokage, and that is a guaranteed cause for war, a war which they certainly do not intend to fight as of now. Therefore, the only option left to them would be to file a legal complaint against me in the daimyo's court, to have me prosecuted, and the last time I checked, the daimyo's court, had a backlog of cases worth ten years. You should have realized by now, grandmother, that I do not attempt anything without calculating all possible outcomes. Have a good day. Reha concluded softly and left his grandmother's office, leaving her speechless. Reha had nailed it spot on. There were no miscalculations, which was his greatest miscalculation. In addition, as he had intended, everything was about to fall into the worst-case scenario because of his actions, which was vital to his plan. Niyujito was about to have a very harsh dose of reality assault her. Chapter 6 Diplomacy is a Pile of Horseshit Diplomacy To constitute political life in a state presupposes a good man whereas to have to recourse to violence in order to make oneself a ruler in a republic presupposes a bad man. Hence very rarely will there be found a good man willing to use bad methods in order to make himself a ruler, though with a good end in view. Nor will any reasonable man blame him for taking any action, however extraordinary, which may be of service in the organizing of a kingdom or the constituting of a republic. It is a sound maxim that reprehensible actions may be justified by their effects, and that when that effect is good, it always justifies the action. For it is the man who uses violence to spoil things, not the one who uses it to mend them, that is blameworthy. A ruler should therefore disregard the reproach of being thought cruel where it enables him to keep his subjects united and loyal. For he who quells disorder by a very few signal examples will in the end be more merciful than he who from too great leniency permits things to take their course and so result in chaos and bloodshed, for these hurt the whole state, whereas the severities of the ruler injure individuals only. It is essential therefore, for a ruler who desires to maintain his position, to have learned how to be other than good, and to use or not use his goodness as necessity requires. Everyone sees what you seem to be, but few see you for what you are. As he noticed the emblazoned brass plaque that contained these words, which he had hung in his office, Danzo could not help but feel nostalgic. This was possibly one of the finer lessons that he had imbibed from the Naidem Hokage, and it had been a lesson well learnt. Toborama Senju was known far and wide as a maverick, a man who ignored no one but did not listen to anyone. For years, when his advisors offered advice on how to deal with situations, he listened to their advice and yet made decisions on his own, completely ignoring whatever advice had been offered to him. Trust no one, that had been his motto. Moreover, it seemed that his descendant was following in his exalted grandfather's footsteps quite well. He had never quite trusted the diplomatic mission sent by Kumo, and he had been pleasantly surprised when Tsunade had ordered stringent surveillance on the diplomatic group. However, 
He had not expected them to take such a bold approach as to attempt to kidnap the heir of one of Kanoha's premier bloodline clans. In retrospect, it was a plan bordering on outright genius. If the kidnapper had managed to conduct his operation without being detected, then Kanoha would never have been able to recover the child. Their only saving grace was in the fact that the kidnapper had been identified beyond possible doubt during mid-execution of his mission, and that was their only saving grace, otherwise the repercussions for the actions undertaken by the boy would have been quite severe. However, when the kidnapper had brazenly taken shelter in the embassy of Kaminari no Kuni, even Danzo had come to the conclusion that attacking an embassy was too risky, even for an unsanctioned force like his. He had expected a siege situation, where the embassy would be surrounded by thousands of ninja, preventing the possibility of them escaping with the child, but that, he knew would never have been a foolproof guarantee. And then, he had arrived, the grandson of the Hokage, and the great-grandson of the Naidame Hokage, the last of the Senju, and like a whirlwind, brazenly breaking down barriers, he had stormed an embassy, and had summarily executed every living being that had existed in that edifice, and brought it down, and had retrieved the child. And now, the world was baying for his blood. It would be interesting to see how Tsunade would handle this situation. He had received reports of the infamous conversation she had had with her grandson in the aftermath of the butchering of Kumo as the event had been termed, and he had realized then and there, that this boy was what the village of Kanoha now needed. The Royal Council of Hai no Kuni was today hosting a very special summit. In attendance were the diplomatic delegates from all major and minor nations, here to protest the murder of diplomacy, as they claimed, and along with Koharu and Hamura, Danzo had arrived with Tsunade to attend that summit. In attendance were the diplomats from Sichi no Kuni, Mizu no Kuni, Kaminari no Kuni, and Kaze no Kuni, along with the diplomats from other minor and major nations as well, in attendance with their bodyguards, who were most definitely disguised Janobi. The security for this entire event was watertight, with the entire armed forces of Hai no Kuni, and ninja forces of Kanoha on full alert, and present in full force. Even Danzo was very interested in seeing how things were going to play out. What was ironic, Danzo reflected idly, was the fact that Kanoha and Hai no Kuni, despite being the true victims, were being portrayed as aggressors, while the true culprits were being portrayed as victims. This event did not actually concern any of the other nations in the slightest, but since it was an attack on a diplomatic embassy, a situation that no one currently present in the room had ever thought possible, they were all here to demand accountability from Hai no Kuni and Kanoha. In view of the damage done to international diplomacy as a whole, or so they had claimed, which as far as Danzo was concerned, was a pile of horse shit in his opinion. They were here, because they were rattled. Kanoha was known as the most peaceful of all the five hidden villages. Tree huggers, that is what they were called. How low the mighty had fallen, Danzo mused idly as he looked at the smirks on the faces of the other diplomats, to think that a village, which had produced ninja like Hashirama and Tobarama Senju, and Uchiha Madara and Namake's Minato, was called weak was an unbearable affront. No, they were here, because they wanted to reevaluate the village and the new Hokage, because as far as world opinion was concerned, this was an unprecedented event, and they wanted to confirm whether this was an accident, or whether Kanoha actually possessed enough political will to conduct such an incident again. The ambassador of Kaminari no Kuni, Lady Miyako, was a career pacifist, who hated violence of any sort. In a career that was dominated by males, she had risen to her current position through sheer tenacity and intelligence. Although she grudgingly accepted the fact that she also happened to be the niece of the daimyo of Kaminari no Kuni had played a part in it. She abhorred violence on principle, and as a result, she also abhorred women who practiced them, namely Kunoichi, and for that reason, the current Hokage, Tsunade, was on the very top of her not-so-well-liked people list. When she had learned of the massacre of their embassy, she had been horrified, to learn that somebody had dared to attack harmless diplomats was something, which she had never thought possible. But then, they had received information, that their hidden village had tried to suborn the goodwill of international relations, and had flouted those rules to conduct their detestable missions. She accepted the fact that Kumogakure, as much as she hated to do so, had violated the laws of international diplomacy, and was the guilty party. However, what she detested even more was the ruthlessness with which Kanoha had reacted to this travesty. Surely, there had been no need to massacre all those people. If Kumogakure had broken the covenant, then Kanoha should have left it to Kaminari no Kuni to discipline their overzealous hidden village. Instead of resorting to such brutal retaliation, she told herself as she prepared to make her arguments. True, they had tried to kidnap a little child, for a bloodline, and although she found it detestable, she knew that she had no say in protesting against making such decisions. Hidden villages were granted autonomy on equal status with the countries they served, and they had the authority to conduct such missions. However, because of the overzealousness of Kumogakure, now Kaminari no Kuni had been embarrassed, and it had fallen upon her to regain her country's honor. And she intended to succeed. 
This meeting has been called forth primarily by the representatives of Kaminari no Kuni, and as such, Lady Miyako now has the floor. Kohara spoke out curtly as all eyes turned towards the chief ambassador of Kaminari no Kuni. The events of the past week have been difficult ones for everybody involved, Miyako began, and we mourn the loss of so many of our valued retainers. We accept the fact that the hidden village of Kaminari no Kuni was indeed at fault here, and assure everybody that we shall take steps to rectify that problem. While we are gratified that the hostage in question was rescued, we cannot condone the methods that were used to end the crisis. The success of diplomacy and international relations depends upon the forbearance of the host nations in which the diplomatic missions are situated. We have requested the convening of this council for accomplishing two very important goals. First, to ensure that such violations of international relationships do not occur again, and second, to make certain that people responsible for these deplorable events are brought to justice. Many of the diplomats of the other nations were carefully eyeing the reactions of the Hokage, to better judge how she would deal with it. This was an interesting situation, and they wanted to see how things played out. Just to be clear, Lady Miyako, Kohara began again, when you talked about events that undermined the sanctity of international relationships, were you referring to the kidnapping attempt conducted by your hidden village against one of the premier clans of our hidden village? She asked smoothly while everybody in the chamber sat up a bit straighter. The daimyo of Hai no Kuni had a rather amused look on his face, as he carefully observed the banter. No, Lady Koharu, that is very much a separate issue. I was referring to the uninvited attack by the grandson of the Hokage on our embassy, she pointed out stiffly as Kohara slowly nodded. Ah, I see, you are referring to the attack that ended the hostage crisis successfully, she said pleasantly, while the face of Miyako colored up. Danzo was watching the proceedings with a suppressed smile. If negotiations were an ocean, then Kohara was the great white shark in it. It was a pleasure to watch her negotiate and fluster her opponents with delicately placed phrases and inconvenient truths. The result is not the issue, Miyako countered firmly. At the moment, I am deeply concerned with the means. I see, Kohara said quietly as she gazed at the woman softly, and what would you like to do about it? I wish for the Hokage's grandson to be taken into custody immediately, and handed over to us, Miyako spoke out while the temperature in the room dropped quite a bit. That was a bold demand to make. And what do you hope to accomplish with that move? Kohara asked again. We need to formally ascertain whether laws were broken and boundaries were overstepped, Miyako replied. I see, and what about the overzealous actions committed by your shinobi village? One could almost construe that move as an act of war. And may I bring to your notice, that in recent weeks, preceding this unfortunate event, Kanoha has been hit with a spate of raids, conducted by enemy shinobi, and again, most of them have been solely focused on the Hyuga clan, in whom your hidden village is known to have an unhealthy interest. We also have actionable intelligence that all of these attacks were again conducted by your hidden village. Are we to consider this as a declaration of war? Kohara asked quietly while Miyako stumbled with a look of surprise clearly etched on her face. I have no knowledge of this, she admitted truthfully. However, if you were to share your intelligence with us, I will make sure that your concerns are addressed, and if it is indeed proven that our hidden village has exceeded its mandate, I assure you, we will bring them to justice, she spoke out while silence reigned in the room. Danzo snorted, he had no doubt they would. The rakage would produce a disposable ninja and lay the blame squarely on that unfortunate person's shoulders by terming it a rogue operation, and have them executed while absolving himself of all responsibility. Very well, leaving that matter aside, Kohara continued, I am afraid that we cannot grant your request, she concluded while Miyako narrowed her eyes. Is it because the culprit is the grandson of the Hokage? Miyako asked quietly while everybody stilled. Oh, most assuredly not, Kohara waved her hands to indicate as if it was a trivial matter, as you know, the boy is a civilian and not a ninja under the employ of Kanahigaku no Sato, and therefore, he cannot be tried under laws that pertain to shinobi. And unfortunately, I must remind you that since Hai no Kuni and Kaminari no Kuni do not possess an extradition treaty to hand over criminals to each other, I am afraid that we cannot hand him over to you. We really wish we could have helped you, but laws are laws and our hands are tied. You are welcome to file a complaint against him in the daimyo's court though, she concluded without any emotion on her face. You expect us to believe that the grandson of the Hokage is not a ninja? Do you take us for fools, Lady Koharu? The representative of Kaze no Kuni interjected, with a look of incredulity on his face. You misunderstand me, gentlemen and ladies, Koharu spoke again. I said he is not a ninja under the employ of Kanahugaku no Sato. I never said that he was not a practitioner of the ninja arts at all. Even though he practices the shinobi arts, technically, he is still a civilian, a highly gifted civilian, but a civilian nonetheless, she concluded with a thin smile while the other delegates looked extremely cross. So you tell us that the only way that we can make this murderer, who butchered innocent civilians in his zeal to get to a kidnapper, account for his crimes, is to file a complaint against him in the daimyo's court. Is that it? Miyako asked sharply. 
Indeed, Koharu replied demurely, although I am afraid that it may take some time, she added with just a bit of hesitation at the end. How long would that be? The representative of Tsuchi no Kuni asked Wanli, as if he had expected this response. Well, the last time we checked, it appears that the daimyo's court does have a backlog of cases, just around ten years worth that is all, but I assure you, he will be brought to justice, Kohara concluded while an angry hiss escaped from many of the present delegates. This is an outrage. You, you are trying to protect a murderer who murdered innocent people, this Miyako began shrilly, when Tsunade stood up, and at that, Miyako stopped her rant and stared at the woman while the room fell silent. Up yours, sweetheart, Tsunade spoke calmly, and in full view of the entire royal council and the assembled delegates, she gave the noblewoman from Kaminari no Kuni, the most well-known salute in the world, the finger. Pindrop silence prevailed in the chambers, as everybody was too shocked to react to this outrageous response by the Hokage in contravention to all known diplomatic behavior. I will say this now, Tsunade began curtly, ignoring the extremely offended looks on the faces of all the assembled foreign delegates who were present, my grandson is not a ninja of Kanoha and as such he cannot be held accountable for his actions under the guidelines that prescribe to shinobi personnel internationally. And personally, I believe that he has committed no crime, not when he acted unilaterally to save the life and honor of an innocent child, she concluded while Miyako's face reddened. That does not give him the right to kill innocent people. We would not have minded if he had killed the kidnapper, but your grandson mindlessly slaughtered innocent diplomats and workers, who were not associated with that crime in any way, the woman from Kumo snapped back. So you say, but at that time, how was he to be sure that who was innocent and who was not, for all we know, all of them could have been involved, Tsunade spoke casually while the eyes of everybody widened. Danzo was now paying more interest to Tsunade's words. I knew that she had changed, but I had no idea as to how much, this is a welcome surprise, these people have become too used to Saratobi's pacifist tendencies, now they will learn that Kanoha will no longer accept such aggressive behaviors. So he decided to do a judge, jury, and executioner act on them? This is not a jungle, Tsunadeheim. This is a civilized world, and there are rules which are expected to be followed by everyone, if they wish to exist in this society, Miyako spoke angrily. If the acts of your people, such as the kidnapping a four-year-old child, as conducted by that so-called ambassador of your hidden village is the standard you set for civilized behavior, then I regard the actions undertaken by my grandson as the act of a gentleman, Tsunade quipped back, and a very tense silence followed that statement. You go too far, Miyako snapped back as she glared at the Hokage. Not nearly far enough, Tsunade retorted at which Miyako's jaws fell open in shock, you are very lucky in the fact that my grandson is not an official ninja of Kanoha, because otherwise, your hidden village's actions would have elicited a response under our new doctrine, Tsunade concluded. Instantly, Danzo, Koharu, and Hamura sat up straighter and looked at each other. Tsunade had told them nothing of that sort. New doctrine? The representative of Tsuchi no Kuni asked in a careful tone, while everybody else became silent. Even the daimyo of Hai no Kuni began to pay more attention. Indeed, perhaps your hidden villages have failed to gather intelligence on this matter, Tsunade spoke off-handedly, at which the eyes of many of the delegates narrowed. No matter, I shall inform you personally, so please listen carefully, Tsunade continued, oblivious to the furor she had caused. As of now, the official doctrine and policy of Kanoha is to meet unwarranted acts of violence with extremely brutal retaliation. In other words, if your military forces engage our people outside of authorized shinobi missions or wars, then their actions will be countered with extremely lethal retaliation, similar to the one executed by my grandson. We will make the cost of conducting such terrorist activities in Hai no Kuni and Kanahigakur no Sato so horrific, that no one will dare to think of conducting such acts against us in the future. If you kill one of us, we will kill ten of you. If you kill ten of us, we will kill a hundred of you. If you kill a hundred of us, then we will kill a thousand of you. If you kill a thousand of us, then we will raise you to the ground to the point where nothing will survive, not even fucking bacteria. That is as of now, the official policy of Kanahigakur no Sato, Tsunade concluded grimly. For the first time in decades, Danzo's jaws were wide open in shock. To think that he would hear such words from the granddaughter of Hashirama Senju, and the student of Haruzan Saratobi, Danzo had never expected this in his wildest dreams. The reaction to the Hokage statement produced an extremely tense silence. Tsunade had just threatened the entire world, a feat that no one had dared to do before, and frankly speaking, they had never expected something like this to occur. Finally, the representative of Mizu no Kuni spoke out, Your grandson is not your grandfather, you would do well to remember that, he concluded in a gravelly tone as everybody glared at her. I believe I am a better judge of that, considering that unlike any of you, I have actually had the chance to know both of them, and am in a far better position to make that judgment apart from others, she quipped back while a ripple of unease spread through the present diplomats. 
You cannot take on the entire world, you know, the representative of Kaze no Kuni spoke out softly as he gazed at the Hokage. You forget, sir, that we already have, and that we still came out on top, Tsunade replied quietly, at which most of the diplomats winced as they remembered the outcome of the first and second shinobi wars, where Kanoha had taken on all the other hidden villages, and emerged on top. Daimyo-sama, Miyako began again, does the Hokage speak for you and Hai no Kuni? She asked quietly as everybody turned quiet. The daimyo who had observed everything silently, spoke for the first time, No, Lady Miyako, she does not, at which a smile appeared on her face, but stopped quickly when the daimyo continued, I speak for Hai no Kuni and Kanahigakuru no Sato, but in this instance, Hokage Dano's words mirror my own. The daimyo spoke softly at which the faces of the delegates clouded with worried frowns. And what of our request to have Senju Reha handed over to us for judgment? Miyako asked again. That will not happen. Not when your hidden village has the arrogance to flout the conventions of international relations so blatantly and attempts such a heinous crime against an innocent child, and then dares to proclaim us the offenders. As of now, we consider the words of your hidden village and your realm worth less than the dirt that lies beneath our feet. And may I ask you to inform your uncle that if he intends to go to war with us over this incident, then inform him that we too can do the same, and that we are much better at warfare than his own forces are capable of, the daimyo concluded softly, and stood up indicating that the meeting was over. As the assembled delegates walked out, they walked out with heavy hearts. They had not expected the meeting to go so off track at all. Too used to Saratobi's pacifist tendencies, they had never expected the new Hokage to take such a heavy hand in her replies. They realized without delay that Kanoha would now no longer allow others to run rush out over it, and it rankled sorely in their mind. As the delegation from Kaminari no Kuni walked out, the attendant of Lady Miyako was surprised to see that a female attendant was beckoning her. Surprised, she stopped for a moment as the woman approached her. Miss Yujito, the Hokage would like to have a word with you, the woman spoke softly. Yujito was taken aback. As far as she knew, nobody knew of her existence, and certainly not her true identity as the third in command of Kumogakure's shinobi forces. How did Kanoha know about her? Everybody had thought that she was a lady-in-waiting for Lady Miyako, and not a Kunoichi. How did Kanoha see through her charade? Please follow me, the woman asked again at which Yujito nodded absent-mindedly and began to follow the woman. Why does she want to speak with me? She asked after a while, at which the attendant replied softly, she wishes for you to deliver a message to the rakage. Yujito's eyes hardened as she considered the implications of that fact. As she entered the chambers of the Hokage, she noted that the Hokage was seated in a chair behind an ornate desk while three other elders were seated in a corner of the room. As the attendant came and followed by Yujito, Tsunade thanked her and then curtly dismissed her. After a cursory look by the Hokage, the three elders walked out as well, leaving the two of them alone inside the chamber. May I know why I have been called, Hokage-sama? Yujito asked quietly as Tsunade gazed at the young woman softly. You are Niyujito, yes? Tsunade asked quietly and Yujito nodded in agreement. I have a gift for you, from my grandson, Tsunade spoke softly and indicated towards a small burlap sack that lay at the corner of the desk. Intrigued, Yujito slowly walked towards the lumpy sack and opened it, and then immediately, she stepped back in revulsion. Inside the sack was the severed head of her subordinate, Nakamura. What is the meaning of this? Yujito asked Tsunade sharply as she began to analyze the scenario. If Nakamura had been captured then that meant that Kanoha was probably aware of her true identity. Don't overestimate yourself, girl, Tsunade spoke curtly as she glared at Yujito as if she was reading her thoughts. We had him under surveillance since before you planned the raid on Hayashi Hyuga, Tsunade concluded, at which Yujito's eyes widened. If it helps you, know this, I took down Shigeo personally, Tsunade continued at which Yujito involuntarily took a step back. Dissimulation was something that Tsunade excelled in, and she realized that her mixture of truths and lies was sorely rankling the young girl in front of her, and smirking lightly, the Hokage continued. We let him be, because there is a saying in Kanoha, hit him three times and even Buddha will get angry. This was the second and last warning that we will give, next time you pull something like this, even I will not be able to hold back my grandson, little kitty, Tsunade spoke with a cruel smirk. At which Yujito finally paled and began to sweat a little. Oh please, Tsunade smirked at seeing the discomfort etched on the girl's face. Did you really think that I wouldn't realize what you are? Girl, my grandfather used to keep that little fur ball in your stomach as a pet in our family backyard along with its other companions. And I have seen them all, even together. And you thought that I wouldn't recognize that fur ball in your stomach? Hell, I used to kick it around in my childhood myself, along with my grandfather. You Kumo Nin truly do overestimate yourselves, Tsunade snorted while Yujito began to tremble in shock and outright humiliation. As she turned to leave, Tsunade gave one final parting shot, tell that overgrown mastodon you call Akaga and his equally bullheaded brother, that next time your village pulls something like this, 
then the consequences will be very unpleasant for him and his village, she spoke curtly while Yujito nodded jerkily and hastily walked out, trembling and shaken to her core. As she watched the girl leave, Tsunade let out a small smile. The girl truly was a tough and resourceful young woman, and given few more years she would be even more impressive, of that, Tsunade had no doubt. She is like a shark in a pond of fishes, Tsunade thought quietly as she analyzed the girl. However, like Yujito, Tsunade too was a shark. But for all the bluster and bravado that the young woman had thrown forward, Tsunade had something that the young woman lacked. Forty Years in the Water Chapter 7 Spies, Councils, and Fights As she watched the young woman leave, Tsunade heaved a silent sigh of relief. With any luck, once he heard of that confrontation, I would back off from making any more provocations. The man was extremely hard-headed, and his stubborn attitude was a minor legend in the shinobi community. Truthfully speaking, Tsunade had not really relished taking such a hard stance, but even she had realized belatedly what the other elders had. In his zealous efforts to keep Konoha safe after the devastation caused by the Kyubi, Saratobi had unintentionally weakened Konoha's standing on the international scene. In addition, now it was up to her to make sure that the situation did not deteriorate any further. She was sure that she would have faced a lot of dissension from the council for taking such a drastic step. She frowned. That was another thing which she intended to change soon within the village. The council was beginning to overstep its authorities again, as they had with Saratobi, after he had assumed control after the Kyubi's attack. She would have to show them exactly who was in charge again. Her grin turned feral as she imagined that delicious prospect. Well, that went well a voice muttered quietly, and she turned around to see Jiraiya lounging around on a chair at the opposite end of the room. That was all right, you know, at the conference, I mean, Jiraiya continued as he had that same infuriating smirk on his face, you did all right, Haim. You showed the world that you had balls, and for once, I don't mean those two hanging on your chest, he grinned wanly, while Sonate just sighed. Although, in any other situation, that phrase would have seemed extremely crass and corny, for the moment she understood what her teammate was saying. Hey, you sure put a burr under everybody's saddle. Hell, I think you almost gave Danzo a hard-on, he chuckled as he continued in the same tone. One thing is for sure, they will now think twice before trying to poke their nose in our affairs again, Jiraiya concluded softly, as his gaze turned serious. All, except Kumogakure, and even you know it. I will have to do something drastic after this. He cannot afford not to, with what I have done here, he will face enormous loss of face at home, and he will have to do something drastic, if only to save his face and reputation. Tsunade replied softly. So that is why you went so hard on that girl, huh? Jiraiya nodded, as if something had made sense, I guess so, but you know, with your declaration here, the other villages will probably make at least one aggressive probe towards us, just to check whether you were bluffing or not. And now, we will have to retaliate brutally against the next blow that will happen, which I can bet my ass is going to happen soon, Jiraiya warned her as he looked at her. I am not worried about them, Jiraiya, I am more worried about what will happen at home, Tsunade retorted calmly. Well, for the first time, I think even Danzo and the elders will be on your side, but Saratobi-sensei is gonna kick your hide six ways to Sunday after what you have done here, not to mention the clan heads. Yep, the council is going to bitch about this royally, Jiraiya too agreed as he smirked. Then I will just have to show them why they are the council and I am the Hokage, but even I am worried about sensei's reaction, Tsunade admitted softly. Yeah, well, we will deal with it when it happens, Jiraiya spoke out softly. Coming back to that, what happened with the task I gave you? Tsunade asked as she glared at him. For her question, she was rewarded, with a slip of paper that he slid over the desk. It is Akio's writing, I just received it when you were talking to that girl, that was all he said. Who then is this Akio? Tsunade asked. Akio, Tsunade, is a nom de plume, a mere identification mark, a name with which my informant has chosen to identify himself, whenever he has sent me extremely sensitive information. He is important, not for himself, but for the great people with whom he is in touch with, if he actually is, for I have no means of verifying it. He is like the jackal with the lion, anything that is insignificant in companionship with anything that is formidable, not only formidable, but also sinister, in the highest degree sinister. That is where his services become invaluable. For instance, he was the one who gave us the meager evidence that we have, against Danzo, and that's just an example of one of his major successes. That damn old criminal, Tsunade muttered with distaste as she wrinkled her nose, as the name of the former commander of Root was mentioned. You give the man too little credit, Haim. I don't think you understand the scope and reach of that man, and neither did I, until Akio provided me with some of the information that he had gathered. By calling Danzo a criminal, you are uttering libel in the eyes of the world, and there lies the wonder of it. The greatest schemer to have ever been born, the controller of the underworld, a brain that might have made or marred the destiny of many nations, that is the true extent of his capabilities. However, 
He is so aloof from general suspicion, so immune from criticism, so admirable in managing his public persona, that he could probably drag you, the Hokage, to court, win in a case of defamation, and take compensation from you. A Hokage who uses her authority to bully a crippled old man, that is how it would have played out, if that were to happen. I have to admit, until I learned of the true extent of his activities from Akio, even I had underestimated the man. His involvement in clandestine affairs goes far beyond what we might have expected. Saratobi-sensei should have disposed of him long ago, Tsunade growled in reply as she heard Jiraiya state his point. But why then did he not? Think on it, and you will notice the shroud that Danzo has woven around himself to ensure his safety. Tell me, have you ever entered his office in the Hokage Tower? Yes. Once or twice, when I have had the misfortune of doing so. Rather Spartan, isn't it, in its appearance? I suppose, Tsunade nodded gingerly. Tell me, did you by any chance notice a small painting hanging behind his chair on the wall? Yes, but I didn't give it much notice. Maybe you should have. That painting, Tsunadeheim, is a painting by Kondo Kurosaki, and it is worth more than eight million ryo. Kondo Kurosaki is one of the most famous painters this world has ever seen, but that is not the point here. Haven't you yet wondered how a retired shinobi who was just the commander of a defunct ANBU division managed to acquire such a priceless piece of art? In addition, may I remind you, according to the records that Kanoha has, his personal assets don't exceed the value of six million, and he receives an annual pension of only four hundred thousand. By all accounts, he should have become a pauper when he bought that painting, and yet Jiraiya stopped as finally a flicker of interest came upon Tsunade's face. How indeed? Tsunade muttered thoughtfully as she too gazed at the tiny piece of parchment in front of her. That's what amazed even me, Jiraiya admitted softly. However, you have now seen the point of the picture. It shows him to be a very wealthy man. How did he acquire the said wealth? He is unmarried, he has no rich relatives, and his personal familial inheritance is non-existent. And yet he owns a painting worth eight million. Well? Oh, come on, Tsunade, even you must get the inference, Jiraiya complained as he looked at the Hokage. He has an unknown source of income, and we don't know what it is, Tsunade concluded softly as she gazed at the tiny note, her respect for this unknown Akio raising a notch. Exactly. Once I got the information from Akio, I set my own information network on the trail, and do you know what we have found? Something of monumental importance, no doubt, Tsunade spoke up as she looked at Jiraiya expectantly. Nothing. The answer rocked the Hokage right back to her heels. That's, she began in a hushed tone, at which Jiraiya nodded, intriguing, isn't it? So, we have the ends of both sides, namely, we know that he has a clandestine source of income, which in its scope is enormous, and we know he controls it. But what we don't know is, what is it? Tsunade asked quietly. You don't see the picture, Haim. The man has hidden himself so effectively that you underestimate him even now. I mentioned the painting just to gain your attention. I have no doubt that he has dozens of similar sources of income, each carefully hidden in a dozen different nations, no doubt, Jiraiya concluded. And this Akio fellow found it all out? Tsunade asked in an incredulous tone. Not exactly. He knew of them, of course, but he told me that if I wanted to find out more, I would have to do it on my own. He just nudged me in the proper direction, that is all. I have no doubt that he knew all of this, even before he informed me, Jiraiya explained in a serious tone. So, what has he sent you this time? Tsunade asked as she gazed at the illegible writing, illegible to her at least. Well, you see, what we have is a curious partnership. He sends me information, and in return, I send him information, and this time, he has sent me quite a juicy tidbit. Hey, it looks I will have to pay his price after all, Jiraiya chuckled. Just what kind of information? And more importantly, who is this Akio, and why haven't I heard of him before? Tsunade asked as she looked at Jiraiya with an inquisitive look in her eyes. I don't know who he is, Jiraiya replied glibly, at which Tsunade stood up in shock. Are you kidding me? She snarled as she gazed at her teammate. Calm down, Tsunade, Jiraiya replied in a soothing tone, while she glared at him. Jiraiya, how can you be so stupid? He could be an enemy of the village. He could be someone who could use your information to... Tsunade began when Jiraiya raised his hands, and she stopped her tirade. Believe me, I have tried to find out who he is myself, but even I cannot find out. He contacted me four years ago, and offered the first bit of information as an opening deal between us. I would give him the information he needed, and in return, he would give me the information I needed. No personal contact between us at all, and that was his only condition. He also assured me that he had no desire in gaining any information on Kanoha from me, and let's face it, if he can uncover all this information on Danzo, which I myself could not, then what is to say that he couldn't gain that information himself? Jiraiya asked reasonably, while Tsunade considered that. Well, this is a surprise, Jiraiya muttered as he looked at the parchment. 
Tell me, Haim, have you received any proposals for a marriage between Reha and a member of the Yamanaka clan, or the Aburame, or even the Karama clan? Why, yes, Tsunade replied in a startled tone, not just them though, even Tsuminazuka has offered her daughter's hand in marriage, as have at least another twelve prominent families. It seems that the Goaiken ban is desperate to ensure that Reha marries at the earliest, so that the Senju clan may be further revived. I however told them, that the ultimate decision lies with him, and that I will not force him, she concluded quietly. And you are lucky that you did so, Jiraiya replied softly. What do you mean? Tsunade asked quietly. It means Tsunadeheim, that Danzo has already made a move to ensnare Reha in his web, Jiraiya replied grimly. What? Tsunade exclaimed in shock as she gazed at Jiraiya with widening eyes. You don't know this, but when Saratobi sensei nominated your name for the position of the Godain, Danzo protested it, saying that you were unreliable because you had abandoned Konoha, and not looked back once. At that, Saratobi sensei replied that you had an extremely important reason to do so, and he further stated that it was so important, that it could not be revealed even to the Goikaban. And boy, did Danzo flip at that. However, after that, sensei conferred with the daimyo in private, and immediately after that, the daimyo nodded his assent to your appointment, flatly overriding all protests, Jiraiya explained quietly. So sensei, Tsunade began as she realized what had happened. Yeah, he had to reveal to the daimyo, that you were raising the great-grandson of the Naidem Hokage, who was the sole heir of the Senju clan, and against that, Danzo's protests were thrown out like waste paper. It seems that he had it planned out completely. That old monkey. When I get my hands on him, Tsunade stood up raging madly, but after a while, she sat down with a huff, with a wry smile on her face as she composed herself. Yeah, he still hasn't lost his touch, Jiraiya chuckled as he looked at the princess. So, what has this Akio sent to you this time? Tsunade asked quietly. It was he who informed me that Danzo was still maintaining and running root as his own private militia, and that they had infiltrated almost all quarters of Kanoha's government. Therefore, I asked him to find out who were his main supporters, and he has delivered. It appears that the Yamanaka, Aburame and the Karama clans are allied with him, and the majority of his militia is made up of their members, Jiraiya concluded as he gazed at Tsunade, who looked shocked beyond comprehension. But I know Inoichi and Shibile, Tsunade spluttered incoherently as she gazed at Jiraiya in shock. I don't know about Shibi, but I will bet that Inoichi is as unaware of this as we were. He may be the clan head, but that does not mean that his clan members cannot go behind his back. I will bet that most of the Yamanaka clan members who are with Root, have maintained their true allegiance with that division in utmost secrecy, and the Aburame, well, their mentality almost matches Danzo's, so I would not be too surprised if they were allied with him. Moreover, the Karama, well, with what happened with the clan head's family, the clan has lost most of its prestige in the village, and unlike the other clans, they are not that well known, so I guess that they must have allied with Danzo in desperation to revive their lost status, Jiraiya concluded softly. But what does this have to do with Reha? Tsunade asked in agitation as she glared at the piece of parchment. Don't you see it, Haim? Reha's arrival in the village threw all of Danzo's schemes into total anarchy. He is the great-grandson of the Naidame Hokage, and by that account the great-grandnephew of the Shodai, not to mention being your adoptive grandson, of you, who is one of the Sanin and the current Hokage, and to top it all, he is now the last male Senju. By all accounts, a most enticing target for anybody looking to increase his or her political prestige in the village. By my information, he has already replaced even Uchiha Itachi as the most eligible bachelor in the village. Moreover, apart from all that, his capabilities are well known as well. Therefore, it was of the utmost importance to Danzo to ingratiate himself with the boy, but you were in his way, Jiraiya explained softly. Me? Tsunade asked incredulously as she took in the information. Yes, you, Jiraiya replied authoritatively, you raised him in secret, and moreover, you did not allow his existence to become public to the village, and that was a slap on the face to the Goiken ban. If he had been raised in the village, they would have found a way to get the boy under their influence, but that was not possible. In addition, when you returned, you granted him his wish, and did not allow him to be a shinobi, placing him further beyond their reach. They are getting desperate, Tsunade. For them, the boy's heritage and the influence that comes with it is too great a chance to pass up. They will do anything to get the boy to endorse their ideology and viewpoints. And since you have forbidden any form of official contact with him, the only way they can get close to him is through someone who is close enough to him. And the only ones close to him are Saratobi Sensei, you, Shizen and me. And that will not work. So, they want someone else close to him. Someone who they believe can subtly influence even him, and thus, indirectly, gain a chance to influence even you. And who can be closer to a man than his wife? Son of a bitch. Tsunade swore as the implications of what Jiraiya was explaining sunk into her mind. Ingenious, isn't it? Jiraiya chuckled quietly, 
Only a convoluted mind like Danzo's could come up with a scheme like this. The proposals from those three clans, specifically those three girls, you must avoid at all costs. I have no doubts that they are agents of Root, Jiraiya spoke quietly while Sonate's face began coloring up. I am going to rip their freaking heads off. She roared as she smashed the desk into pieces and began to move ahead to deal with them immediately. Jiraiya instantly pulled her back, calm down, he roared as the woman began to struggle to get out of his grip. Have you forgotten what Reha is like? Hell, they would have a better chance of influencing a stone than him. That is why I said that you had done a good thing, by declaring that you would leave the choice to him, and those girls can never make him interested in them, no matter what they try, so he is safe for the moment, Jiraiya concluded as Sonate ceased her struggles. Her eyes took on a hardened glint. The next time when the council would gather, they would be in for a very rude shock. But sooner or later their patience will run out, and then we will have a problem on our hands, Jiraiya admitted quietly after a moment, as he too gazed at Tsunade. So, what do you suggest then? She asked snidely as she gazed at him. Get him hitched, Jiraiya replied bluntly, while Tsunade's eyes widened, get him hitched before the pressure on him by the council becomes too much, that will cripple all their plans, Jiraiya spoke quietly while Tsunade's eyes narrowed. You have got to be joking. Where in the hell will I find a girl who can match his temperament? You can't be serious. Tsunade replied haltingly, as she gazed at Jiraiya. Where is he anyway? Jiraiya asked at which, she frowned, he said he had some personal business to take care of. Well, apart from that there is another way we can appease the council, Jiraiya began as he looked at her slyly. What is it? Tsunade asked, her eyes twitching. Well, the council is desperate for the Senju clan's revival, right, and this is an alternative if you don't want Reha to be bothered, he began quietly at which Tsunade narrowed her eyes. Go on, she spoke softly as a suspicion began to form in her mind. Well, you are a Senju as well, and if Reha can't get hitched then maybe you could get hitched instead, with me, and I assure you, I am more than manly enough to ensure the revival of your clan, Jiraiya replied with a lecherous grin on his face. With a sigh, Tsunade palmed her face, as her suspicion was proven true. The next moment, Jiraiya was punched through the door of her office and he went sailing through the air as he crashed down in a broken heap as he collided with the wall opposite to the room, while she left, and although she was furious, a small smile was still present on her face. Meanwhile, in Amigekyur. Amigekyur no Sato was a minor shinobi village, which had had the misfortune of being located between three of the great five nations. And despite being a small village in a backward nation, contradictorily for it, it was a highly industrialized village. It had been the hotbed of numerous wars, which had been fought on its ground, some by itself, which it had declared on others, and at other times, other nations had fought their wars on this ground as well. Overall, Amigekyo was known as the most violent place in the shinobi nations. In addition, it was a rather loosely knit village, with many of its shinobi being missing mean, or criminals. Lacking the power to have a kage status, it however had a leader, who while not being a kage, was a ninja whom even the other kages did not dare to offend. His name was Hanzo, and he was known all over as Salamander Hanzo, the man who had single-handedly defeated the three San Nin and bestowed upon them their title. However, today, Hanzo was in no mood to ponder upon all these facts, for he was busy in trying to find out why his village had been invaded by this person, who by all accounts should not have been here in the first place. Senju Reha, news of your exploits has reached even these aged ears, Hanzo spoke out in a guttural tone as he gazed at the young man who stood in front of him. The young man neither acknowledged him, nor did he deign to reply. He seemed to be scouting out the location. I have declared that my nation is in lockdown, and that shinobi from other nation are not to be allowed in. And yet, you have brazenly broken that decree, and invaded my home. Give me one reason as to why I shouldn't slay you where you stand, the man asked quietly as he gazed at the youngster. I am not a ninja, I am a civilian, the boy replied finally, as he gazed at the man who was standing on his summon, the king of salamanders, looking down upon him. Ah yes, I had heard something of this sort, the civilian ninja, or something of that sort, isn't that what you are known as nowadays? Be gone, boy, I have no desire to bandy words about with Horizon's toys, or you will face my wrath and this time, I will show you no mercy, as I once did, with your grandmother, the man growled as he looked at the boy. I must, however, decline. You see, I am here, to reclaim vengeance on my clan's part, for the treachery you dealt it with. Today, you will perish, and I will see to it, Reha replied softly, as he gazed at the legendary shinobi. You think you can beat me, me, who defeated even your grandmother, when she was with her team, a team that was said to be unbeatable in the entire world? Do not forget, boy, not only have I beaten your grandmother, but I was even responsible for, Hanzo snarled when Reha interrupted him coldly. Treacherously killing my great-grandfather, the Naidame Hokage, after you betrayed him, yes, I do know about it, the boy spoke out coldly, while Hanzo glared at him as he was stopped mid-tirade, 
before he could claim responsibility for having defeated the Nidame Hokage. Your penchant for betraying your allies surpasses even your fame, Hanzo of the Salamanders. It is well known that you formed an alliance with Senju Toborama and Konoha, and that you then betrayed him, by attacking him when he was with just a few of his guards, with an overwhelming force. And I also know that you are still forced to wear that breathing apparatus to survive, because of the crushing damage that he dealt to your lungs, before you treacherously killed him. Reha spoke out quietly while Hanzo glared at the boy, cursing him for daring to look at him with such insolence. Instantly, he formed some hand seals and a javelin made of ice hurtled towards the young Senju. However, just as the javelin reached him, the boy unsheathed his sword, and in a brilliant streak of yellow light, slashed it into a dozen pieces. The Ragin! Hanzo exclaimed in shock as he warily eyed the blade in the boy's hands. He had not forgotten the damage that blade had inflicted on him all those years ago. So, reclaimed your family's weapon, have you? Hanzo muttered gutturally as he gazed at the blade wearily. He seemed surprised at the blade's size though. Instead of the broadsword, which it usually looked like when wielded by Rokusho Aoi, it seemed more like an ordinary sword, only thing was, its blade was composed entirely of lightning. Yes, from that fool, called Aoi, I believe, Reha replied softly, I suppose you are wondering why it looks so different. Well, this blade was designed so that it could be controlled by the user's chakra. The more uncontrolled and unrefined it is, the more heavier and ungainly it becomes, and its size makes it too unwieldy. However, in the hands of a senju, who is its rightful wielder, its true power is released, he finished quietly while Hanzo glared at him with an inscrutable look. Be as it may, its power is still no match for the power of my pet, Hanzo stated as he gazed at the boy. Yes, I agree, and since you have your own summon, let me grace you with my own. This is not a summoning in the actual sense, technically, but their power surpasses that of any known summon in the entire shinobi world, Reha replied softly, as he rapidly began to make some hand seals, and plunged his hands into the ground. Kuchios, Edo Tensei. As a startled salamander Hanzo watched with surprised eyes, two coffins, bearing the tags of one and two rows from the ground. And when they opened, for the first time in fifty years, even salamander Hanzo took a step back in fear, because standing in front of him, were the only two people whom even he had feared in his youth. The Senju Brothers. Senju Hashirama and Senju Toborama. Chapter 8. Adverse Reactions. The wind blows hot across the broken land. The soft sigh of its passage is the only sound in a landscape that but a heartbeat pass rang loud with the terrible music of war. However, the war is over now. The battle is ended. The ancient shinobi, once renowned as an icon for the entire shinobi world, now lays helpless on the floor, his back against the wall, after suffering injuries too many to count, and can do naught but stare helplessly at the youngster who has done this to him. Who are you to be able to do this to me of all people? Hanzo of Amagekyu wheezed out, even as he coughed out a fair amount of blood as he looked at the youngster standing in front of him with the Raiji no Kenalite in his hands, flanked by the immortal corpses of his ancestors, awaiting the boy's commands. I do not see why this is relevant, Hanzo-san, Reha replied matter-of-factly, as he gazed at the wizen shinobi, you were an enemy, and I have done what anybody would do, to defeat their enemies, it is to be expected after all in battle, the boy concluded, while the old man snorted. You are not Senju, boy, I know the Senju well, and no Senju worth his blood would have dared to do what you have done here today, this emotionless slaughter, this precise and calculated massacre, not even in the era of the warring clans have I seen such a methodical destruction. Even the infamous drones created by Danzo of Kanoha possess a shred of conscience despite his claims to the contrary, which is lacking in you, so why are you doing this? Hanzo spoke out, even as Reha remained unfazed. I see, Reha paused, as he looked at the old man, so, you seek a reason for why I have destroyed everything you hold dear. But reason exists for those who cannot go on living without clinging on to them. Vanish Hanzo, with your death the destruction of everything that is immoral in the shinobi world begins, and someone like you, could never understand my reasoning, for it is beyond the edge of reason. With that, the Raijin no Ken flashed one last time as a spray of blood flew into the air, and with it, the life of Salamander Hanzo. The teenager turned to look around at the immobile forms of Hashirama and Toborama, who were looking at him with an inscrutable look on their faces. You disapprove of my actions, yes? He asked, even as the two ancient shinobi remained impassive. Your actions are not ours to judge, boy, Hashirama spoke out softly, while Toborama just glared at him, what you are doing has the potential to destabilize this entire world but not doing so poses an even greater danger so I will withhold judgment for now remember, there will be consequences for using this technique, but somehow. I think that for you it will not matter, the second Hokage sighed, as he looked at his descendant, before the teenager nodded. Hanzo's remaining supporters have been routed, he said, even as he witnessed the commotion occurring near the base of Hanzo's tower. Most are abandoning the hidden rain, but those who hold on to the will to resist us, some dozens in total, 
appear to be reorganizing near their leader's residence to make their last stand. Eliminate them, leave not a shred of Hanzo's tyrannical legacy behind, he ordered, even as the two Kaigas leapt below to obey his commands. Even as these events were occurring, he did not notice a pair of eyes watching his every move, assessing him, evaluating him, and burning his image into their minds. What do we do, Payne? Conan asked quietly, as she looked at the Deva path, which was observing the events with a critical eye. Nothing we do nothing. The palace of the daimyo of Kaminari no Kuni, around the same time. Lord Toranaga, the chamberlain of the daimyo of Kaminari no Kuni, took one look at his ruler's face, and knew that blood would be shed soon in the days to come. My lord, the chamberlain said, bowing deeply. Mori Masanari, the daimyo of Kaminari no Kuni, made an imperial nod of acknowledgement in return. Lord Toranaga, my honored niece has brought to my attention that the Grand Council of Daimyos and all the hidden villages have held our hidden village, Kumogakur no Sado, to be responsible for creating the situation, which led to the destruction of our embassy in Hai no Kuni, and the subsequent deaths of our loyal citizens. Who were blameless in this juncture, the daimyo paused, even as he futilely tried to bring his rage under control. We are not pleased, nor are we pleased with the fact that the rakage has allowed his shinobi to create a situation which has nearly led our country to war. My niece informs me, that Lord Shimizu, the ruler of Hai no Kuni, is most irate and suspects treachery most foul on our part. To that effect, it appears that he has issued orders to his own shinobi to deal with any of our shinobi with no quarter. Therefore, I think the time has come for us to assert to our shinobi forces, as to why our word must be obeyed, and make them aware of the consequences of disobedience. The chamberlain seemed to consider his ruler's bold suggestion cautiously. It was one thing to have a give-and-take relationship with the shinobi where they each played their part. However, it was another thing entirely to threaten their subordinates outright, but still, he knew that his lord would not budge. It was now a matter of prestige for the ruler, and he would not budge even if his life depended on it. Summon Derui, and also, summon the Kinjin Kyodai, the daimyo ordered, at which, the chamberlain finally looked up at his ruler in shock. My lord, surely you do not mean to, the chamberlain half arose to protest, while his ruler raised his hand and stopped him mid-tirade. I think it is about time that the rakage learns that there are limits to what I will indulge from him and his shinobi, the daimyo spoke forcefully as he glared at the chamberlain, who bowed stiffly even as he felt his brow dampen with sweat. As the chamberlain slowly turned around to depart, he heard his ruler command him, Lord Toranaga, also please send a message to the rakage, and ask him to select a replacement to serve as the new vessel of the two-tailed cat, since it is because of the actions of the current vessel, that our honor and our nation's honor has been stained. Let him know that nothing less than her execution will expiate that stain upon our honor. Our station and our dignity as the daimyo demands it, and we will accept nothing less, and inform the Kinjin Kyodai that this is our will. Hi, daimyo-sama. Meanwhile, at Kanahigakur no Sado. The Hokage on the other hand, faced a problem that was far more different in nature. As the rumors of her extraordinary performance at the Grand Council meeting had spread, the rumor mills inside the village were churning non-stop. Nonetheless, the ninja of Kanahigakur unanimously agreed that the Hokage's bold decision to address the world from a position of force had been a savvy maneuver. The other shinobi villages had no doubt expected the ninja of Kanahigakur to be their usual reticent selves in the face of adversity. Not this time, Senju Tsunade had proven herself a commanding foe. Many of the ninja felt comforted to know that the Hokage was taking control. The Hokage was the one person inside the village for whom both the civilians and ninja held the most respect. Some ninja thought of the Hokage as a zealot whose love for the village bordered on obsession, but even they agreed when it came to fighting the enemies of the village the Hokage was the one who would stand up and play hardball. Most of the shinobi had actually relished the change that Tsunade's rule had brought to the village. The complacency of sorts that had been present during Saratobi's reign had all but vanished, as Tsunade had brought many radical changes to improve the efficiency of the village's functioning, and they relished it. However, some of the council heads were not too pleased, as they believed that the Hokage was moving ahead too fast, and was becoming too reckless. Then came the kicker, and as the details of the meeting were made public, many members of the council decided that it was finally time to rein the Hokage in, before she endangered them all, with her reckless actions. The poor fools had no idea that Tsunade intended to return their favor in spades. As she entered the council chambers, flanked by Jiraiya and Shizun, Tsunade knew that this would possibly be the stormiest council meeting in the history of this village. The council of Konoha was divided into two parts, the shinobi and the civilian. The shinobi council comprised of all the clan heads, and the leaders of the major shinobi organizations of the village, including the ANBU, TNI, the Medic Corps, and so forth. And they generally advised the Hokage on matters pertaining to the running of the village's military forces. Similarly, the civilian council had sway over all non-military related issues, like economy, trade, agriculture, and local administration. 
By law, the civilian council was not allowed to intercede in the military council, but in recent times, it had encroached upon this forbidden plateau quite brazenly, and now, she intended to rectify it. After the death of the fourth Hokage, the third Hokage had been forced to hand over the general administration of the village to this council, as the military council was up to its neck in its efforts to maintain the safety of their village. By the time the Sandame and the military council had managed to ensure Konoha's safety from foreign threats, the civilian council had firmly entrenched itself into the military infrastructure of the village, and the Hokage had found it difficult to dislodge them from this position lest he risk a civil war. As she entered the council, Tsunade noticed that many of the shinobi were giving her glowing looks, while the civilians were looking at her with a myriad of emotions, ranging from fear to loathing. Tsunade-sama, Shika Kanara, the jonin commander of Kanoha continued with a grim smile, Welcome back to Kanoha. You have been missed. Shikaka paused to allow the council members to greet her, and then made his request. Please, along come with us. The elder council has assembled. There is much to be discussed. Fine, the woman muttered, crossing her arms. Let's get this over with. The various mutterings inside Kanoha's council chamber went silent when Tsunade entered the room, with the third and the two advisors Hamura and Kohara at her back, followed by Shimura Danzo and Jiraiya. Now, since that irritating grand council meeting is over, the slug princess replied as she strode across the chamber to assume the Hokage's place at the head position. Let's get right down to business, she continued, sitting down. I want to hear a complete report on the border situation. I've been brought up to speed a little, but I want details. I especially want to know if any of the other villages have moved any of their forces near our village, and I want a complete analysis of the intelligence reports in my hands by the end of the day. Tsunade's clipped, business-like tone caused several civilian council members to stir in a nervous manner. She had no interest in tolerating ceremonial niceties as her esteemed predecessor had. The clan heads and other shinobi representatives concealed their grins. Well, Tsunade-sama, Hamura began, as he looked at the reports in front of him, as of now, all the other villages are maintaining their distance from us, but we expect a sharp spike in skirmishes with Kumo in the near future, and we need to decide on how to deal with that as early as possible. Pardon my interruption, Hokage-sama, but we wish for you to provide us with some clarifications about certain rumors that have been permeating through this village, about certain events that have occurred at the Grand Council meeting, a member from the Civilian Council spoke up, as he looked at the Hokage, who had narrowed her eyes at the interruption, with a vein pulsing in her forehead, even as she noticed that many of the members of the Shinobi Council seemed resigned to such interruptions. Just how deep did this rot run? I was under the impression that military matters are of no concern to the Civilian Council, Tsunade asked, even as she looked around at the elders for an explanation to this interruption, to which they had the grace to look abashed, while the Civilian Council seemed flustered. It is of our concern, when your actions have the potential to push our village into a conflict with not just one village, but every village in existence, Tsunade-sama, the counselor spoke again, with a bit of venom inflected in his tone, even as the temperature in the room warmed considerably. This was nothing less than a diplomatic accusation that the new Hokage was not conducting her duties efficiently. The blonde Sanin stared the counselor down, intent upon making her dominance known. She was Hokage now, and the civilian council's incessant meddling in the village leader's business was no longer going to be tolerated. Perhaps, and perhaps it would be a whole lot smarter, Tsunade parroted right back, knowing that the man was right on the mark but unwilling to admit as much, not to insinuate that I'm a liar. I know what I am doing, and that's all that's important. I won't hear the issue again. But the civilian council, too accustomed to Sarutobi's gentle diplomatic maneuvers failed to notice the signs of impending doom that many of the shinobi recognized was coming. This was not going to end well. As of now, another counselor interrupted, Kanoha has precious little resources to spare right now, given the mounting situation on our borders, looking at the Hokage, and it is a matter of concern to us, as this has the potential to escalate into something beyond our control, he concluded, in a rather gentle manner. Placing a rather logical point at the table. Despite the fact that we are not shinobi, we too live in this village, and this is our business as well since it affects us. That fact alone mandates us with all the authority we need, on behalf of the citizens of this village, you must listen to us, the counselor who had spoken first spoke out again, causing many an eyebrow to rise at the bold statement. We are not unsympathetic to your position, counselor, Tsunade spoke curtly, but the shinobi have taken over dominion of the village, as it has been, since the foundation of hidden villages, to vouchsafe an ancient, mutually shared destiny. We do not have the luxury of considering the interests of others. We are required to make hard choices, driven by self-interest. These may, at times, not suit the rest of the village, she paused, as the implied message that the civilians had no choice but to listen to the shinobi was delivered subtly once again, causing many of the members of the civilian council's faces to color up, even as she continued. But the rest of the world now threatens us. They have repeatedly threatened us, and injured us. Only a fool would not expect us to defend ourselves. 
Are you a fool, counselor? She asked directly, as everybody froze at their spots, as they witnessed the blatant dressing down that was being delivered by the Hokage. And so you decide to place the lives of everybody in this village at risk, just because they demand your grandson's life as payment? What hypocrisy! That was as far as the man went, for in the next instant, he felt himself being hoisted in the air, as Sonata's hand crushed his throat in a vice-like grip, and he found himself dangling in midair, with his feet kicking wildly. Listen very carefully to what I say, civilian, she enunciated clearly, even as a terrified silence reigned in the chambers. The fact that I even allow you to speak to me directly in this chamber is a gift that I bestow upon you. You do not order me. You beg for my appreciation and then wait to see if I choose to bestow it upon you, she growled, even as the man's eyes rolled back, as he began to lose consciousness. Tsunade, that's enough. Saratobi's booming voice came through the silence, shearing it like a scythe cutting through a stalk of wheat. With a disdainful snort, Tsunade flung the now terrified civilian counselor with a jerk of her hand, even as he flew through the air, and collided with the wall at the opposite end as he sank into a dead faint. Though Tsunade's method violated all debate procedures known to human civilization, it had an immediate impact on the council, halting all conversation in an instant. The elders looked in shock towards the Hokage, noting the vein pulsing on her temple. The clan heads looked about the chamber at their shocked civilian counterparts with more than a little amusement, though the degrees varied. The Inazuka pack leader almost burst in into mocking laughter at their expense. Meanwhile the dust settled and revealed a small impact crater where the now unconscious counselor had struck the ground. The slug princess looked around the room, demanding order, and not a soul dared to challenge her on the point. Just because the Sandane chose to indulge your whims and fancies, do not dare to assume that I shall allow you the same liberties. Do not delude yourself into thinking that I know nothing of what you have all done behind his back, she retorted, even as she gazed at the now terrified civilian council members, who were staring at her with her absolute horror. You, you can't, another terrified member squeaked out, as Sonate gave a cruel smile. Oh, afraid are you, that your dirty laundry is about to be aired in public? Let me see, if I can clear up the air a bit, she spoke as she looked at Jiraiya, who silently handed her a sheaf of papers. Inside this, are the detailed descriptions of every fraudulent activity undertaken by you all, under the name of the council. These lists contain the details of the properties that you have misappropriated, the innocent victims whom you have framed and sentenced to various degrees of punishments, in order to settle your personal vendettas, the amount of wealth, that you have embezzled from the village, down to the last reel. Everything is in here, she spoke harshly, as she threw the documents across the desk in a careless manner. The chamber became a literal din as the various counselors suggested theories, and made wild accusations, even as the members of the Shinobi Council took their time in examining the documents, which they were surprised to see, were completely accurate, even to the point of mentioning the time at which the said fraudulent activities were conducted. Down to the last minute. As of now, you have a choice, Tsunade continued, even as she looked at the quaking civilian counselors, who all had the looks of a deer cornered by a predator, all of you, will leave here voluntarily, and surrender your positions in the council, and pay back to the village, every last time you stole, after which, you and families will quietly leave the village, with your lives intact, never to return, on pain of death. Fail to do so, and I shall have every single one of you executed, and have your families and clans dispossessed of all their belongings, and have them banished, with the stigma of being traitors attached to their names, she concluded. Even as Saratobi looked at her with shock, but after a few minutes, the old man resigned himself to what was occurring and shrugged it off, thereby signifying his assent. Slowly, the members of the civilian council stood up, as members of the ANBU came ahead to escort them out of the building. Sighing deeply, Tsunade sank down into her chair, even as she looked at Saratobi, Saratobi Sensei, once this is all over, I want you to personally select and create a new civilian council, and please make sure that this time, it is made up of civilians who are, or were, in any case, shinobi. Having pure civilians in the council, was just a disaster waiting to happen, especially in a military society like ours, she concluded, while many of the shinobi council members murmured their assent. Now that this trifling matter is over, I think it is time we return to the original matter at hand, Koharu spoke out curtly, deftly maneuvering the situation away from the tense atmosphere. Indeed, but I would like to know how the Hokage managed to gather such incriminating evidence against the traitors of the former civilian council. In such a short time, Danzo mused, as he looked at Tsunade, who gave a thin smile. I am the Hokage, Danzo-san, there is nothing in this village that remains a secret from my eyes, nothing, not even those which are considered inviolate, she spoke curtly, even as a ripple of unease spread through all the clan heads, specifically, the Uchiha and the Hyuga clan heads, whose knuckles whitened in tension. Even as all the clan heads shared an uneasy look. Which brings me to the point, I have a few decrees to issue as of now, she continued, as she looked at all the clan heads, who seemed to sit up a bit straighter. As of now, the Uchiha military police stands disbanded, 
instead it will be now reformed as the Kanoha Military Police, and will no longer be manned solely by the members of the Uchiha clan, she announced curtly, even as Figaku rose up to protest, only to be silenced by a glare from Jiraiya. Furthermore, I am here by granting the request of the Uchiha clan to move their enclave into the village, and this can begin as soon as the Uchiha clan finishes their preparations. That nearly caused an uproar, even as Figaku Uchiha finally fell back into his seat, with an astonished look on his face. However, as he looked at the Hokage's face, she gave him a curt nod, at which, his heart nearly skipped a beat. She knew, she knew what they were planning, and she is offering us an olive branch before it comes to that. Hokage-sama, surely, there is no need for, Hamira began hesitantly, when Tsunade cut in with an icy clarity. No need? I think you underestimate the gravity of the situation we face, Elder, or did you just forget the fact that we have just forced every hidden village in the world to reassess their opinion of us? Do you think that any of those villages, and especially Kumogakure, will sit still when he have so blatantly humiliated them in front of the entire world? Now, more than ever, we need every single of our shinobi to stave off the skirmish that is about to come. And I don't think that having the most powerful members of the most powerful clan in the village being confined as mere policemen in such a crucial time is a viable option, considering the fact that their task can be conducted by even mere chunin. Frankly speaking, it is an insult to a capable clan like the Uchiha, and I will not see such valuable assets be squandered in such a crucial time, she retorted harshly, while Hamura and Kohara frowned. Tsunade knew the actual reason as to why the elders wished the Uchiha to be confined, and frankly speaking, she thought that the rationale behind it was pure bullshit. However, she wanted to see if the counselors had the courage to voice their true reasoning behind it in public, but she knew they would not. They couldn't afford to, as they didn't have a shred of proof. Do not think that I favor your clan unduly, Fugaku, Tsunade turned upon the Uchiha head, who was looking rather smug, as she gave him a dose of harsh reality as well. Time and again, your clan has claimed to be the best in the village, now it is time for you to prove it, she retorted calmly, even as Fugaku nodded curtly. We will not let you down, Hokage-sama, the man promised, even as his mind began to analyze the rationale behind such a radical move. She knows more than she is letting on, maybe there is still a way out. Concerning the events that have occurred in the Grand Council meeting, Kohara continued, even as she looked at Tsunade with an inscrutable look, it is guaranteed that the other villages will now definitely try to make at least one aggressive attempt against our forces. In order to determine if the Hokage's statements were true, or a calculated bluff. Therefore, I believe that we have no choice but to react in an extremely brutal way to the next aggressive probe done against us by any of the other villages, regardless of the situation. The response must be so brutal that all the other nations must become aware that Kanoha will no longer tolerate such insults, the old woman continued, even as the other members gave their assent, albeit hesitantly. So, all that needs to be done, is for us to see who will take the first plunge, Kumo, or any of the other villages, Shikaka mused out, as everybody became silent. Suddenly, their concentration was diverted by the sound of a small sound of a toad, which had just teleported in front of Jiraiya, with a scroll tied on its back. Frowning, Jiraiya took the scroll out and began to read the contents. As his eyes progressed further, his shoulders slackened considerably, even as his eyes widened to comical proportions. Jiraiya, Tsunade called out, even as the toad sage finally handed over the scroll to his teacher, who was sitting next to him, as he wiped his brow. I don't think anybody will be conducting any aggressive probes against us in the immediate future, Tsunade. Your grandson has just seen to that, he spoke wanly, even as Saratobi suddenly began to cough as he accidentally choked on the ashes from his tobacco pipe, even as his eyes too, went wide after seeing what was written inside. What do you mean? Reha has just killed Salamander Hanzo in single combat. What if Naruto was the great grandson of Tobarama? And thanks for watching my video till the end. If you enjoyed this content, then do consider subscribing to my channel and leave a like if you guys need the next part. Comment down and thanks for watching the video and see you guys in the next video.